Let's get this. Uh, Rich, you want to kick it off? Uh, sure. Happy June. Wait a, uh, wait a few minutes. I don't know. Uh, up to you. It's uh, tw yeah. We can get started. I think people will join in. Um, is who's uh? Let me just see who's in. Is Robert in yet? Uh, I don't. Well, participants. Now we have twenty five attendees. Let's go. We have a bunch of attendees. So. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let's we'll just see who's from the board. Um, uh, along with attendees, we have. Because uh, there's some people who are from the board. What can I So lame with this. We've got, uh, look at that. We got a, a bunch wow. of. Wow. Beth Gilmore, we have Jean Kylie, uh, Neon. Uh, Valerie's here. Then we, Steve Simon's here. We got a lot of, uh, I see Sydney. Look at that. A bunch of tenants at my meeting. So Susan's here. She's right over here. Uh, Susan, Darren here. Yeah, Susan's here. Yeah. Uh, Valerie's here. Elizabeth, I keep trying to promote yes, Elizabeth. Chris. Yes, I did. You're uh, able to do that from where you are, right? Yeah. We oh, still haven't our... seen anyone from the bid, have we? Well, let, let, let's, uh, I'll, let me work on that in the background. Robert is on. Can you see Robert? Uh, I. He's coming through now. Yes, I do. I see. Oh, yeah, I see Robert. Elizabeth, so, Valerie, uh, Carter is here. Carter is here. Oh, Carter is yeah. here. Yep. Can't hear us. Who can't hear us? Oh, because we're muted. No, we're not muted. No, no, we can hear you. I can hear you. Hear okay, you. I don't know why Jose Montfort can't hear us. Maybe you need to raise your volume. I don't know. It's not on our end. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. And Rich, you'll let us know when the people from the Hudson Square bid are here, right? Because I don't know who's coming. Yeah, well, let me work on that in the background. I, I Can we go out of order and let Robert go first while we work to get, I'll get the MNLA people um, and the bid. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Do you want to start with introductions? And yes. Welcome. Little dance. Well, yes, happy June, everyone. Uh, welcome to our CB2 Parks and Waterfront June meeting. Uh, oh, we're we have uh, three topics on our agenda. We are going to hear from Robert Atterbury, the executive vice president of Hudson River Park uh, Trust. He's going to he's the uh, responsible for parks relations and programs. He's going to talk about the summer events and then we're going to turn it over to parks who have also working with the bid. We're going to hear from Will Morrison on Washington Square Park plans for the summer events. And we're going to hear about uh, the lot at 388 Hudson Street. Uh, but uh, first, let's um, just do introductions. Uh, maybe you can go around the room. Susanna, help if you could help. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Susanna Aaron. I'm the vice chair of the committee. Rich Capicolo is the chair of the committee. And I'm Ann Hager, and I am a committee member. Chris Ignis, committee member. Charlie Secunda, committee member. Uh, we have Ben from CB2 in the room and then a bunch of people from CB2 attending remotely. Yeah, let's just have, uh, let's see, Ritu, can you introduce yourself? To Chatri and I'm a board member. Okay, I'm working through. Elizabeth, uh, I see you there. Elizabeth Gilmore, um, public member. Thank yeah. you. And Sh Sharon, can you hear me? I think you're on mute. Uh, Sharon, can you uh, hear me? Can yeah, you hear pretend. Me? Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm Sharon Willems. I'm a public member. And Coral, can you go next? Yes, Coral Dawson, a public member as well. Right, and then we've got Matt on. Uh, Matt Metzger's here. Person. Um, Matt Metzger says he has very low bandwidth. Uh, but hello from Matt Metzger. So, uh, I think those are our committee members. We, 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 I'm here, Frederick Siegel. Oh, there she is. Oh, good, Frederick. I was just looking for you on the panelists or on the uh, good. Welcome, Sorry Frederick. A He's a board Party. member. Uh, for for those in attendance, we have other community board members who are not committee members, but they love this committee so much. Uh, they are honorary members. And of course, that starts with our chair, Susan Kent, who says hi. And I see Carter's there in the background. 
Carter is here in person. In person. Right. And then we've got Valerie's here on there, which is always great. Valerie De La Rosa. Yeah. And we've got some other uh, celebrities in our midst uh, that we'll highlight. We've got Pete and we've got uh, Nicole is here from Councilmember Botcher's office. And we'll we'll make sure to highlight everybody as we go through. But um, if if you don't mind, can you, I think Robert, you're probably the shortest if, if you don't mind going first, we could let you get out of here. Of course, you're welcome to stay and hear the other things, but if- I, I would love to, it's my like fourth, night meeting, I think, or where this is the third of four this week. I'm happy to it. I my apologies to my friends at Hudson Square Bid for jumping you. Um yeah. I will be fast. Um so uh, I wanted to give you guys a little bit as we're entering the season. Obviously, this is like parks are booming. If you've been over in the park recently, we are full. Um, it is a really great time uh, to be in the parks business. Always uh, a blast, um, although a lot of work. Um, I would just want to give you guys a quick overview of some of the things we have going on, and then I'll move off. Um, for folks, um, you may have seen Gansvort Peninsula. Um, we are still working on the building. Um, at this point, uh, the restrooms are waiting for um, an FDNY inspection. Um, we have done all we can um, to move that along. Uh, we are hopeful that it will be open soon, um, but we do need final sign off um, from the uh, FDNY <laughs> for it. Um, the uh, final, we have some final trees um, on it, uh, working on it, and some water uh, uh, issues, connection issues uh, within it. Uh, but otherwise, Gansvort is nearly done uh, and thriving. Um, I, if folks have been over, uh, the beach is quite popular, um, as are the other features, the 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 uh, field and the dog run. Um, next, uh, uh, in just a few weeks, on the 18th, um, we will be uh, at Community Board uh, ones. Um, I forget what they call them. They are not WPE, that is uh, CB4. They are a different parks committee, their Waterfront Parks and Cultural, WPC, I believe, committee, um, to talk about the estuarium design. That is our uh, planned um, uh, science uh, and education uh, facility that is planned for being just north of Science Playground, which you may see down by North Moore. It's in, over your border, um, but it's going to be a really great resource for us. Um, so it's a purpose-built facility with a flow-through research aquarium, much like we have with, currently have at the wet lab um, that has been planned since the beginning, the inception of the park. Um, so we are, I hope, I hope folks, if you are interested, will come down and join and see it. It's certainly a facility that will serve the whole park. Um, uh, last month, you may uh, have uh, seen, uh, we had over uh, 5,000 people come to our Submerged Marine Science Festival up at Pier 84. Um, we had over 30 for exhibitors. Um, it was a really great time. A thousand of those were on, uh, of those few folks were on Friday as part of our uh, field trip. So there were a thousand school kids who came through on Friday where we work with teachers and others to really uh, help move people through. Um, it was a uh, pretty spectacular time. Um, and uh, I, also at Gansport, I will say our team, um, as I should, I should have skipped it, um, has launched uh, a new field trip program, Salt Marsh Science, which is, takes place on the live uh, salt marsh that we planted on the, on the north edge. You will see uh, it is itself uh, growing and expanding uh, with the uh, um, uh, grasses and others filling in. Um, but it is uh, really great to see uh, the response we've gotten from teachers about actually about the new curriculum that we put out for it. Um, I, uh, we have uh, two new uh, CUNY scientists that we're doing partnership for science research this year, um, including uh, that they are, and I'm not gonna say these uh, names because I, I'll screw them up, uh, but we have one person who's using nanopore DNA sequencing technology to monitor microbial communities and harmful microorganisms in river water um, and study the presence of bacteria with antibiotic resistance genes on microplastics in the park. Um, and then we will also have someone else who is looking at the influence of wave energy on our habitat enhancement sites and oyster health in the park. That one's we're really excited about, um, particularly with our new uh, habitat features north of Gansvort, which are in abatement. They are between uh, Gansvort Peninsula, which is landfill, um, and Pier 57, uh, which has its caissons, which go down to the river bottom. So it's actually a protected cove, and it was a very different structure than what we have down in Tribeca by Pier 34, which is quite open with only the protection of some piers that are not immediately there. Um, so we're really interested to see um, and share that science out with our larger community as we look at harp, uh, habitat enhancements uh, across the region. Um, 
We have a really great uh, and robust uh, uh, programming this season. Um, I encourage you all to look at huffingroadpark.org slash events. Um, I won't go through it all. I'll do a couple um, of highlights. Um, we've obviously already started with Submerge, uh, Healthy on the Hudson. If you go by Pier 46 or some of our other piers, North and South, uh, you'll see Healthy on the Hudson. That's our free exercise program going on. Uh, that's about four days a week. We have that in the, in the evenings. Um, we also have uh, our river discovery program. So with Big City Fishing, which is returning to piers um, 26 and 51 and newly up at Pier 97. Um, and as well as everything from nature's walks, uh, you can come down to the Pier 40 wet lab, uh, uh, re our, our research aquarium, uh, where we have, a, would have turned one of our tanks to be a model shoreline salt marsh, much like we have at Gansevoort. And we're helping to explain sort of how those pieces go, uh, but features crabs this year uh, instead of horseshoe crabs, which is what we normally have in the tank. Um, and I'm told it is, it is a fascinating one. It's super interesting uh, to be able to see. Um, and we have, I believe our most return oyster toad fish that you've ever said it is shaped like a softball so you can come see come see that with us um, we also have new programs at Pier 57, uh, Science Stories, Story, uh, Story Collider, um, as well as uh, painting, uh, painting Nature and um, uh, Poetry Nature, where uh, we take folks to different places in the park uh, with science prompts based around our, the ecosystem that to which you in to create art um, and learn together. Um, we also have uh, our uh, ongoing music performances. Uh, so we have uh, this year a returning on Pier 45, our Sunset on the Hudson series that are running this month that will culminate on uh, the Friday, Friday before Pride with Randy Jones, the original Village People Cowboy, um, featuring a uh, playback of the original uh, YMCA uh, uh, music video, which was filmed on what was then Deer Lake Pierce on the west side of Manhattan and is now Hudson River Park. Uh, so it is a very fun full, full circle moment um, we also have uh, this year running uh, newly, and this is a new program for us at uh, 14th Street Park. Uh, we have what we're calling Matinee Music, which is running this month. We have four of them, uh, which are lunchtime concert series for folks who are in the neighborhood uh, and out and about and as well. And we will that will be returning in September. It's one of our first activations in 14th Street Park in that way. And uh, we are hoping to try to capture a little bit of a different audience uh, for the folks who uh, live and work in the neighborhood. Um, we also have uh, upcoming, a uh, number of uh, fun things. Sunset Salsa up at Pier uh, 76. Uh, we have uh, Bollywood and Bangra and Pier 63. Uh, we have Jazz returning to both Pier 84 and newly now Pier 97, um, as well as um, uh, our, some of our, our new programs. So, but, and last, last year was our first partnership with Bike New York, where we host bike classes on Pier 76. Um, that is everything from individuals who can sign up for the weekends. Uh, you also, if you have someone who has a group, a school group, or a class group, uh, a group of friends who wants to sign up to do a group uh, classes for kids or adults uh, for, to learn how to ride a bike, uh, you can set that up with Bike New York. Uh, through, uh, links are on our all on our website, um, and they will teach you how to ride a bike. Uh, you I believe you have to bring your own bike. Um, they do have some bikes for kids uh, stored there. Um, and um, we also have upcoming uh, Broadway on the Boardwalk, which will be happening up in Clinton Cove, that's on the far northern end of the park uh, in July, where we'll be partnering with uh, uh, Broadway artists on Broadway's Mondays, which is Broadway's uh, night, uh, night off uh, for intimate performances with some Broadway stars to sing. Uh, and um, uh, in this fall, uh, and I uh, will, uh, I'm looking forward to see it right before Liberty Weekend or for Liberty Weekend, we'll be having the Unicycle Festival on Pier 76, uh, all part of our program to help get people moving, uh, engage with our bikes, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, getting to use Pier 76 in a fun way. Uh, classics uh, will be returning, include Booth Barbecue in August, um, and you are all welcome to attend um, on August 10th. And uh, Friends, Hudson River Park Friends continues uh, their green team cleanups and volunteering. So we have a lot of those events if you want to look them up uh, and join, you want to come uh, help pick up. Uh, we have our blue team, which does our shorelines now, which is new this year, um, particularly basic and support, getting to feature gulp, our uh, uh, waste shark. Uh, the ro robot, or, or they call it a river Roomba, um, you can get to drive it uh, for, uh, for a brief minute and with some supervision. Um, so with that, uh, I will uh, stop on that piece. We have a, otherwise a lot going on. Pure Friday 45 with decking um, was uh, complete, re replacement was completed. Um, cool. Our water and pieces are on and I will stop because I know folks probably have questions, but come join us. Uh, can I just jump in and say that is a dizzying amount of activity. I just don't know how you do that. And congratulations.
Um, also, I, Rich, you take over whenever you want, but I don't tend to look at the chat during the meetings because there's too much tension on the meeting itself, but I will make an exception because Darlene Lutz asked if she has chopped liver when we cited other people who come to a lot of these meetings and we didn't maybe mention her name. Darlene, you are hardly chopped liver and we are thrilled to have you here. Um, so what's the beef? So what's the beef? About the tennis courts? I don't know. Nicole wants to ask some. How about the brew? Nicole, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. Hello? Yeah. Hello? I think you guys have Darlene. Is she on? Yes, uh, I'm on. have Darlene, yes. I'm on. I just jumped in because I have a lot of, I've, I've tried to gather these uh, community members who have contacted me about this issue going on at the Hudson River Park tennis courts below, uh, uh, below, uh, Pier 40, um, there is a grift going on and it's gotten pretty serious. Uh, people occupying people, there's a gang uh, that's come in that is ruling the courts. They are uh, selling, they are basically occupying the line to get on a court and then selling the spaces or they're selling tennis lessons. So uh, they are uh, one of the, one of the people I think he's on, uh, he's in the attendees, Jacob S. Uh, he is, uh, you know, he's been threatened because he's put up a, you know, hey, this isn't fair. Um, so they're an aggressive group. They're doing this every day now. And um, it's not fair. These are public courts. Uh, it's done on a, you know, system and it's done on a first come first, first serve basis. Um, it is for the community, uh, and this is not, uh, you know, commercial practices aren't allowed here. Um, so thank you so much. I actually saw this come in this afternoon. Um, I think it was the first time that someone has raised with it. Um, it is, I will say, unfortunately, not the first time that we've had um, uh, had issues with folks uh, trying to step in uh, to do uh, sell uh, uh, time on the courts. Um, I will say there are, we actually put up, uh, we have signs up there um, clarifying that it's not allowed um, and directing folks uh, when there are incidents uh, for it um, that they should call um, uh, the 24 seven operations desk uh, so that PEP is able to respond. Um, we do need to be there. Uh, they do need to be able to get out there and see it. Um, they certainly uh, will help for it. And particularly if someone is uh, aggressive behavior or threatening behavior is 100% absolutely against park rules. Um, and they will be able to address that uh, in real time. Um, they are uh, very responsive. Um, and anyone who, uh, who does that, anyone who experiences that sort of thing uh, certainly should call um, um, immediately. Obviously, if it is a late threatening emergency, um, you should call 911 first, um, uh, the NYP, so the NYPD is able to respond. Um, but if there is a, a brewing conflict uh, on or around the courts, um, you certainly can, can and should contact the 24-7 operations desk so PEP is able to respond. On the selling the court time, uh, and this is one that is uh, can be difficult. Um, we certainly selling time, uh, and we had say line sitters who would put out a map mat in front of them advertising their services by this lot. Um, and those are very easy for PEP to try to address directly. Um, they can spot it, they can see it, they can uh, weed those people out um, as doing something uh, wrong. Um, the difficulty comes, um, and this is uh, an issue uh, that is much harder to resolve, uh, is when there is uh, our folks who are, say, are following the otherwise following the rules. They appropriately wait in line, they get on and use the court, um, and then they are, say, working with it as a trainer. Um, certainly folks do, can, and um, play with someone who is helping them with their game. That is parks use. That is, you are allowed to, to exercise with, uh, with a trainer. You can go for a run, you can do burpees on one of our turfs. Um, that is parks use. Um, what become, when it crosses the line, um, is when folks are selling access and court time. Um, that is, they are public courts. You should not have to pay to use our facilities. Um, that is something that we do try to address very directly. 
Um, so we, uh, it, it, the best pay play thing for to do uh, for this, and again, we first got the, our first alert to this that has come in uh, was this afternoon, um, is to call uh, the operations desk when this, when you see this sort of behavior happening, um, so that they can go and uh, get eyes on it to try to see and figure out how to address it. Um, that is the best way. Um, if there is a growing problem. Um, certainly, we can look at whether or not we need to adjust rules or there are other other actions that well, we can take to try to ha help make sure that uh, folks have free and fair access to our courts. We are very proud um, that we are one of the only reservation free uh, courts um, in New York City. Um, that's not the way that other courts, public courts operate. Um, they are incredibly popular. We know that um, certainly line can get long on uh, po in popular hours. Um, but uh, for in the immediate, um, it, it is uh, important that folks call PEP uh, so that we were able to get get a team there and try to address it in real time. I don't know if that helps, Darlene. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that information. Uh, could you post the number in the chat? Yes. Uh, to everyone, thank you. Yes, and, and there, it is on all the signs there, including the signs. Um, and I will say, because uh, I have them here, um, including the signs that are bright orange that we have posted. <laughs> that we are free, open to the public, and selling court time or place in line is strictly prohibited. Uh, and we put those up, I believe, last year um, when we had a, a slightly okay. different problem. Um, oh. But I will also drop it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And I appreciate it. I, I'm getting conflicting information from people actually, like, they are all the time. And it conflicts with the, the volume of video and photographic material that I have been sent. Um, on this that this is a growing problem it's an everyday problem so there seems to be you know there seems to be the the need to galvanize some sort of team to n not nip this in the bud because it's already exploded um but there seems to be you know this is a behavioral exercise now so you know it's not a matter of just calling and pep pep has been called they don't do anything the first precinct throws it over to prep. We have been going through this. We've tried to resolve this. And now we're leaving it up to the trust to tell us what we can do to help you uh, because we're already past some of the points that you you so generously you know mentioned. Um, Thank you, Darlene. That's that's great. I think uh, I think that was really clear and helpful. Um, uh, I wanted to know, does anybody else have any questions for Robert? You're welcome to raise your hand. Uh, Nicole. Thank you. Hi, Robert. So nice to see you. And thank you for the update. I'm really looking forward to Summer on the River. Um, I actually sent you an email today. Maybe I'll save you writing me an email back about uh, the dog run. I've had a number of people talk about the lack of shade uh, in the brand new dog run. And I know you're gonna put in some trees and that takes a while. I don't know if umbrellas are considered or if they're gonna, it's too windy out there. So I just thought I would, you know, find out from you if there's yeah. any plans. Um, so I, there's actually one that I um, have, we've also received directly um, and I have done, we've done a, started to look into. Um, it is, uh, as I understand it, um, uh, I, I com has happened in the past for uh, other dog runs when they were new um, is there is a, a concern about the uh, amount of shade uh, in say the first year or two for it. We do currently have shade trees planted around it that will will grow and will provide additional shade. And certainly um, as uh, we go through the year and the seasons, uh, the angle of the sun changes, they will, they will uh, provide more at different times and the sun is lower. Um, that being said, it is op open to the park. It is a public open space um, and the there is, it is sunny, um, and that is not something that we are able to necessarily do. Um, other features, temporary umbrellas, um, uh, shade structures um, would either involve much more construction and be very expensive, or um, may or may would not necessarily withstand the conditions that are on the river. Um, we are particularly sensitive to, uh, as you mentioned, wind and wind loads on the river uh, and ability for it. We have 
if we have tents, we have other pieces that come down quickly. We don't put out our umbrellas on our overlooks on certain days. Uh, but when we know there's going to be wind issues, um, you will see on say Pier 46, they are metal umbrellas, uh, which have different ability to withstand these sorts of things. Um, it is something we certainly have heard um, and are looking at. I cannot promise we have an immediate solution. Um, it was not uh, designed or built um, for it. It was designed uh, for, the, for the trees to grow and eventually provi provide cover. Um, it may be a little bit of a hot summer um, in there. We do have water on in the dog runs now um, for it that to help cool it off. Um, and we do have uh, four other runs um, if folks uh, need it. Um, but it is it is certainly something that we have uh, a concern we have. Um, I know our operations team is actively looking at it right now about whether or not we would be able to provide some sort of temporary feature in the immediate for for the for this season. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you so much, Robert. Does anybody else have any questions for Robert? I don't see any other hands up. Rich is sending me a text. Oh, um, I, I want to ask you, Rich is asking if I can ask you if there's a security camera at the tennis courts or if one could be installed to catch this bad behavior. Um, I don't know the exact locations of the security cameras, and I probably wouldn't say it in a public meeting if I did. Um, uh, we do uh, have uh, we do have cameras throughout the park. Um, with specific angles and others are always a challenge. Um, we do not say have all 150 upland areas of the park covered um, at all times, um, but uh, it is uh, the most important piece of strategy for, for us to be able to work with PEP on site uh, to be able to address to address address the behavior. Um, security cameras are useful. Um, in part for sort of a, a post-action event um, and where you are able to look to see what happened. Um, they are not uh, a preventative. Um, and I think our goal should be to try to see what we can do to prevent these sorts of conflicts from emerging. Uh, so I, I will raise with our, 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 our public safety director, uh, Chris McGann, our operations team that oversees PEP. Um, and certainly uh, for those, if they're, if threatening or, or abusive behavior emerges, please obviously call immediately um, and we will flag to try to see what we can do uh, and how, what, or not, what we might be able to do to identify uh, what's going on here. Thank you. I just one note from the chat, the, uh, Lynn Pacifico points out that the run sprinklers aren't working. So that might be a note to, to take back. That that yes, I believe we have uh, our spray hoses on, and our as I mentioned, we're still working on some of the water issues at Gansevoort, um, including some of our irrigation and others, which I think right now we're having to do by hand. Um, and then it is uh, so it is uh, certainly uh, on our list. We're actively working on trying to make sure water across the entire peninsula works. Great, thank you. Are there any more questions for Robert about Hudson River Park? Um. I am not seeing any. Uh, Robert, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. And my apologies, Touch River Square again for jumping you in line. Well, so here's a question because I didn't have, first of all, uh, Steve Simon, we want to make sure that everyone- We got him. Got him. We got everybody. The bid is, uh, has been promoted. I have Michelle Richmond and Signe Nielsen and, uh, and Samara, right. Where is she? I got it. Alicia, Samara, Jake, and Alex. Samara, right. I have Alicia. Okay, so everyone is there. Now, Rich, do you want to uh, do Washington Square Park first, or do you want to do 388? I'll leave it up. Uh, uh, Steve, are you, are you on there? Um, I, I don't know how the people in the bid feel. I feel like that's the most robust conversation we're going to have tonight, so it might be useful to just take through the Washington Square Park step first, but I, I'm not as, I didn't set this meeting up, so I don't know. What do you think? Will, do you mind, Will, would you mind listening through the uh, 388 stuff? I do not mind. Thank okay, you. No. In that You're case. Staying, look how relaxed he looks in his picture. He's so ah! calm. So calm. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. All right, so on to the 388. I think uh, we can turn it over. Yeah, uh, everyone who needs to, I think, should has been uh, has been promoted to panelist. If there's anything you need from me, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to give it to you guys to take over. Uh, do I have to enable screen sharing? It's already enabled. Okay, I don't know who of you is starting, but you're all panelists, so. Meet yourself. There's Michelle's got it. Oh, Michelle. 
we can see that now it's coming through to the people remote i can see that but i don't see i don't hear michelle steve is actually kicking us off okay great yes but steve i also off. do not hear him steve's off mute he should be able to speak he's not muted Steve? He may, have, he may have walked away from his uh uh I see him trying to speak. I can see his lips moving. I don't know, <laughs> Steve. He's throwing up his hands. <laughs> I don't see uh, that. We, let's see, I don't see him. No, you just went by. I did? Yeah. Oh, Steve, what's the deal here? You are Sorry. not muted. Uh, you're paused. Just talking. Your outside voice. What? Uh, our tech, our tech magician Mark Diller is suggesting maybe you log out and log back onto the meeting, Steve. If you're having technical difficulties, or turn off, or you can call video. him by phone, turn or turn off your video. Everyone's got a good good idea. Should we let Will go while Steve is working on this? Uh, should we let Will go? Um, yeah, is everyone from the bit okay with us having entertaining Washington Square Park first? Yes, okay. Will, why don't you take over unless you just went and had a cocktail? You might have left. You seem to be unmuted. So he's, oh, you can mute, unmute yourself. No, I think Will decided that okay. he had a little bit of a break, so he went and got a pretzel, a dough pop. Yeah. Uh, Anyone else uh, that so can kick it off? Um, guys, I'm wondering if maybe we should have MNLA start the presentation, and then when Steve is able to speak, he can just jump on, if that's okay. Sounds yes, great. I, can, I can do this. Okay, Thanks. great. Um, Steve, if you come back, we'd love to hear from you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good to be back with you all at, at CB2. Uh, I'm going to uh, pretend that I'm Steve Simon. Uh, next, please. So we are uh, talking about Hudson Houston Plaza, uh, and it's uh, a collaboration among many folks that you see here, uh, DEP, Parks Department, Hudson Square bid, and then the design team uh, on the right side of the screen. Uh, these three agency, uh, agencies and entities are uh, integral to the design process uh, and also to the funding sources. Next. Um, this is a, a site uh, that there are two similar precedents for. One is Manuel Plaza, and the other is Rapkin Gale. Um, and uh, the addresses are shown below. And it they, are, they set a wonderful precedent uh, in terms of how these uh, infrastructure, DEP infrastructure sites uh, can be converted into public space. And we look forward to sharing with you uh, uh, our version of this uh, tonight. Next. Can I just jump in before I just I don't know if it bears uh, repeating to anyone who's attending that this is a site that was used to build one of the, was one of the water tunnel sites. Uh, there are three of them in our district and uh, the, the plazas that Sydney is referring to are ones in our district that have already been turned into parks. So if anyone wasn't aware of that, that's what this is. Right. Thanks. Thank you. OK, next. So uh, we have some uh, key goals uh, for this project to create a new passive open space for the public um, to retain, and this is a, a mandatory, that we retain DEP access to the site 24-7, 365, uh, that we increase the ecological benefits and continue the greening of the Hudson Square and the corridor of Hudson Street. Uh, create a gateway. You see the positioning of this site relative to Hudson Street and its position within Hudson Square uh, itself. It is really a major gateway. 
uh, and to reflect the creative spirit of, of Hudson Square. So it's a quarter of an acre in size. Uh, the budget is what you see here, 3.62 million, uh, and the funding sources uh, are, uh, as I mentioned before. Next. So uh, the project is expected to be somewhere between three and four years in duration. Uh, you can see in red where we are, so we're very early, um, and you are the first group um, that is viewing the <clears throat> design proposal. Uh, then we will, of course, go through procurement and et cetera, and, and further design, et cetera, et cetera. And next. So I'm going to go through the site and existing conditions, and then I'll turn it over to Michelle to talk about the design. We're going to try to keep this at a pretty good clip. Uh, you all know where this is located. We're immediately south of J.J. Walker Park uh, at the intersection of Hudson and West Houston. Next. Um, land use is diverse. Uh, the Hudson Square District is mostly commercial with residential on the eastern side, and then above us, Greenwich Village, much more residential. Next. Um, interesting to look at the positioning of this relative to other open spaces. Uh, Hudson Square has a dearth of open spaces, uh, but immediately surrounding, uh, there are a number of other uh, open spaces, but there none of these is actually kind of a plaza and a passive uh, space. Next. So uh, these are some of the other spaces that uh, quite frankly, our firm designed for Hudson Square uh, bid, um, but more importantly is the positioning of this site as a gateway from really all four uh, points on the compass. And it is a unique opportunity uh, to bring people together. Next. Now, it's interesting that this site has really looked like it does today for many decades. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the only uh, major improvement is what you'll see coming up next, which is the beautiful mural on the city is school that you see on the left side. It's okay, Michelle, you don't need to, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, uh, okay, next. So the the uh, site, as was stated, is a DEP water tunnel infrastructure site, and it must have access. Uh, it has an enormous number of manholes and a number of other structures that require access for maintenance and, uh, and of course, in any kind of an emergency. Uh, so this is the plan view of what are the uh, manholes, vent structures, and hatches. Next. Now, how do we interpret all of this information? There are three zones. Zone A in blue, uh, there can be no foundations. There cannot be any even movable structures or seating within the zone of the turning radius of the truck shown in the black dashed outline, plus some additional offset. Once we get into the B zone, then we have the capability to do low planting uh, and some uh, 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 low planting. We can't dig deep foundations. Zone C is our freest zone. We can have foundations for seating, structures, and trees. So this is really our guide. We cannot vary from this guideline that has been carefully negotiated with DEP. Uh -huh. The uh, truck entrance is in, shown in red. Um, the small blue entrance on West Houston exists, and we're proposing a corner entrance to really capture as many people as possible on the corner. Next. Uh, just a quick section. The current fence is 10 feet high. We know what the size of the truck we have to accommodate. This is all information we've coordinated with DEP. Next. So some quick images of the site, I'm sure you all know it, but the thing, one of the things for us that is so important is the predominance of the Ellis mural on City is School. And we really feel like this is an important backdrop and framing of the whole uh, uh, project. Next. And you can see also uh, most of the infrastructure is uh, flush to grade manholes, those brown circles. 
uh, but we also have two vent structures and two hatch structures that we have to accommodate. Next. And another view of the mural. Next. Uh, community engagement. I do want to spend a teeny bit of time on this. Been many of you on the call tonight and in the audience um, participated in this, for which we are extremely grateful. Next. And you've been very helpful. So we had about a six-week period of rather intensive dialogue with uh, people in the district, workers, city of school folks, and yourselves uh, in the community, both in person uh, and in a virtual meeting. Next. So uh, in summary, there were um, virtually 450 responses, of which 90%, and this was very gratifying, of those responses either live or work within a 15-minute walk uh, of, the, uh, of the site. Um, looking at the donut on the right, um, you will see that the vast majority of responses uh, preferred uh, as much robust landscape as we could get. Uh, flexible spaces came next and uh, available seating came next. Next. Uh, wonderful quotes came out of this. A couple of things just to point out the idea of uh, playful seating, uh, of interactive art, of colorful seating, uh, of unique uh, uh, seating. So it was a it was a very lively, uh, and this came from you know yourselves as well as the city of school. Next, so we kind of synthesized all of that information into five guiding principles that you see here that I will not bore you with reading, but we have uh, adhered to this, and we're going to show you how we responded. Uh, with our design to each of these five guiding principles. Next. And now I'll turn it over to Michelle and I'll be here to answer and help answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Igneem. As a reminder, the constraints do drive the design. I know we have looked at this before, but just keep this in mind as we look at the design. So this is the proposed design for Hudson House in Plaza. The entrances, as Signe mentioned, the the truck access is off of West House or off of Hudson Street. The main pedestrian entrance is canted off the corner to try and capture um, as much flow, pedestrian flow into the site as possible. And then there's a secondary entrance off of West Houston. On the east side, you'll see that the site is dominated by a tree and umbrella bosque. Um, this tree layout allows us to maximize the amount of green and shade on the site, and the umbrellas really allow us to continue um, shade into the sunnier areas of the site without going below ground. Um, on the south and the west sides, you'll see we've integrated a trellis into the fence uh, to try and provide shade into the site um, as much as possible from the south and the west. As that is something that we heard uh, the community would like. We are looking at keeping the uh, site as permeable as possible. So we're looking at using permeable pavers in the larger open space and um, a structural uh, aggregate um, that is accessible uh, below the bosque itself. Uh, there are a couple of different furnishings, which we'll go into detail later, but we have modular furnishings, we have benches, and we have movable furnishings. Again, using the five uh, principles that we got from the community engagement, we are looking at maximizing as much green as possible, really trying to uh, put the landscape forward. Um, we are looking at using colorful and fun elements throughout the design, including the umbrella bosque and the modular furnishings, the flexible spaces. So really looking at having a larger space um, on the in the center of the site and some smaller gathering spaces off to the side. So really trying to create uh, multiple different areas for different size groups, trying to keep it as inclusive as possible and really providing seating uh, to support a multi-generational um, audience. Um, and really trying to make it as welcoming as possible. So one of the things that we heard very clearly from the community is that a transparent fence um, is, is desirable over an opaque fence. And we'll look at this in detail a little bit more, but really trying to maintain visual across the site, having the site be accessible. And so looking at how all this fits together, the city as school mural is on the east side. Um, the tree boss lives within zone C, the umbrella boss continues out into zone B, um, the trellis in, uh, is along uh, 
West Houston along the south side and you'll see some of the DEP infrastructure in front of it. And then we have a taller trellis on the west side uh, due to we need clearance heights, but also it'll provide more shade into, into the site. So what this might begin to feel like, um, we are looking at implanting vines along the trellis so that in the in the summer, it provides more shade and in the winter, it's more open. So we're really trying to maximize um, the seasonality of these spaces, really trying to provide seating for multi multiple generations. We do have an interactive element, which is called the daydreamer, which we'll go into a little bit more uh, momentarily. Um, at the front entrance, the um, trellises frame the entrance and we are really looking at, at at uh, framing views towards the mural. We are also using uh, color and furnishings to draw people in and across the site. For the modular furnishings themselves, one of the reasons we really like this idea is because it allows the site to be set up in multiple different ways. So in multiple different configurations, um, you know, we can provide uh, areas for smaller groups, for larger groups, and potentially for events um, in the long run. So these will actually be on casters and will be moved around site. There is also an option where we have, or a modular furnishing piece where we have um, planting in it as well to try and pull planting into the site where we can't actually plant into the ground. And then within the bosque itself, really trying to maximize the green. Um, one of the things that we heard from the community very clearly also was try the, to try and maximize the experience of the greenery. So really providing seating options and smaller gathering spaces within this within, within the space itself. I'm just gonna quickly run through the site elements since I know I spoke, spoke about them already. But um, on the east side, we are looking at an aggregate with a structural system to really provide it uh, permeability and accessibility into the bosque itself um, and permeable pavers uh, on the areas where we anticipate having larger larger gatherings and uh, DEP access. The tree and umbrella, umbrella bosque uh, is on the, the east side of the site. Um, a transparent fence uh, along the south and the west um, with vines growing up only in the trellis areas. So that would be only in these areas where there's the, the um, reddish orange. And then for the furnishing palette, we are looking at having movable tables and chairs, uh, the Daydreamer interactive feature, which again, I'll talk about in a minute, and it also the modular furnishings, which again, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, benches, uh, both backed and backless in different areas and trash cans on the site. So the interactive feature is the Daydreamer. It is a family of rocking and spinning interactive um, element. And I'm just gonna show a very quick video because no matter how much I describe this, the video will say a thousand words better than I can say. I can say. So you can see that it rocks back and forth. It can spin in all directions. Um, wow. The intent is to have uh, multiple of these next to each other. So there are two along the fence at West Houston and they actually um, emit a sound that is uh, cords and when they are spun in sync together, these cords sync up um, to really provide sort of, uh, uh, interaction across the site and across these elements. There is also a lighted element that you can see here that goes on at night. Um, and then if they're moving at different, uh, the sound changes depending on the direction that you're moving in and if they're moving in sync or not in sync. So again, these are located along the fence at West Houston. They are have a maximum rotation of 22 per minute, but the harder you try to push, the slower it goes. So there is an internal braking mechanism. And then the modular furnishings, again, is a pallet um, so that it can be set up in multiple different ways where you can imagine having both um, individual spaces, even though you're next to other people, but also larger group gatherings and really looking at ways to pull both shade and planting into the central area where we can't have anything in the ground. Um, so having a planter, uh, having umbrellas and some of the modular furnishings and that these modular furnishings would be on casters so they can be moved out of the way if, if necessary. For the lighting, um, there are two uh, light levels that we are proposing on site. Um, within the bosque itself, we are looking at one foot candle average, which is about what site sidewalks are lit to, just for reference. And then within the larger area, um, the larger gathering space, we are looking at having a two foot candle average, which is about what intersections are lit to. So just for reference, that's, that's roughly what we are looking at. There are two... Um, types of lights that we are proposing. There are our pole lights um, along the fence line to allow light to cross into the area where we can't have any footings um, and really light the, the larger portion of the site. 
Um, these will be directed specifically to our site and shielded so that there is not uh, spillage across to the northern site because we know there is future development there. And then within the bosque itself, there is bollard lighting, which is lower um, and intended really to light the pathways. And then again, how this all fits within the different zones is really important. So this is how the design fits into those different zones uh, that is, have, has been negotiated. And then I'm just very quickly gonna run through planting. Um, we have four uh, guiding principles for this to provide a neighborhood co cohesion and context, uh, to really choose plants that promote sustainability and resilience, ecological benefits, and to reflect the creative spirit of the neighborhood. Um, so roughly it is sunnier on the south and west side and much shadier on the east side. And so the, the palette that we are looking at is a little bit of a cooler palette along the ground plane. So really, really looking at the base color groups of, uh, as being purples and blues, uh, yellows and whites. And I'm not gonna speak through all of these plants, but we are looking at using a combination of ferns, grasses, bulbs, and perennials on site to really create um, a, a robust palette uh, that will provide differences in texture um, and different colors throughout the season to really provide um, a varied experience throughout the year. And then for the trees, we're looking at using tree lilac and Persian ironwood. And these are a break from the color group because we are looking at using the colors of the mural, bringing them down into our vertical plans before we go into the cooler palette that is on the ground plane. Um, and then honeysuckle and trumpet creeper are our vines that we are planning for the vine trellis. And then again, trying to provide green throughout the year and pops of color also throughout the year through, through the different plant palette. So ultimately, the elements of the site are the movable and modular furnishings, the tree and umbrella bosque, um, really thinking about flexible spaces, so areas that can provide um, gathering spaces for larger groups, but also areas for smaller groups. Um, the Daydreamer interactive feature is along with West Houston below the trellis, um, and then the vine trellis is along West Houston and, and Hudson Street, a transparent fence, and then really trying to create a, a welcoming entrance. Steve, did you get your sound to work? Let's see, I can't hear. He's on the phone, it looks like. Okay, I was gonna try and pass it back to Steve. Uh, it's muted. A 10 days to start. A 10 days? Star six and then you start nine. Michelle, do you want to show the video of the daydreamer? Steve, I think we can you now. Oh no. no, did it not come through? No, it didn't show. Oh, I apologize. Like, give me a second. I want to see that. <laughs> Which edge? I'm so though that was totally unhelpful that I described this whole video yeah. while nobody could see it. <laughs> All right. So this is the video of the daydreamer. Um, you can see that it is a rotating bench. Um Oh, it okay. rotates in both in multiple directions um, oh. and it can uh, spin in 360. Uh, there is sound that is coming out the bottom um, and then there is a lighted element that goes along the top itself. And again, when they are spun in sync with each other, the cords that are coming out will be in sync. And if you change direction, the cords change as well. This is what it would look like at night. What does it sound like? Um, there are cords. I can try and open. Were you able to hear that? No. Okay. No, I'm just wondering how loud it gets. Um, the intent is that it is really for the experience of the user. So it doesn't uh, spill that far away from the actual element itself. Um, the sound is actually directed down. So okay. it really is intended to be for the immediate area, like the immediate area directly around this element. Thank you. So... Who are we looking for? We are looking for Steve and I don't. Oh, there, Steve, I yeah, can, you on the phone. Can, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, all right. Well, let me apologize for uh, the screw up earlier and uh, uh, thank uh, Signy for uh, coming to my rescue, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and for covering uh, uh, much of what I was going to say. But uh, uh, um, I just want to. Um, I just want to, I guess, uh, reinforce the idea that uh, uh, that this is a very exciting proposal, and um, it's um, 
and and it's really only a, a, and it includes all sorts of uh, things and uh, unique elements that uh, uh, you know w w are only possible really because of the uh, uh, commitment we have from the Hudson Square bid uh, to maintain the plaza and. Uh, uh, you know, this is obviously not something that we could normally do, but uh, uh, but the Hudson Square bid has agreed to take this on and and to uh, make sure that the uh, various special elements that are included in the design are going to be uh, uh, are going to be overseen and uh, and properly maintained. So uh, uh, that's what it re really I think uh, enables us to uh, provide you with a uh, you know again I can't call it a park, you know it's it's only called an open space or a plaza, but it's uh, it's something that's uh, really been brought uh, with this design uh, to a uh, uh, to really the next level, and is a uh, and it's going to be a very special uh, venue and uh, and an asset to the community. So um, um, uh, that's really uh, just uh, that. I just wanted to uh, uh, you know add that uh, uh, make that point, and uh, and I hope uh, Susanna and Mark, uh, you noticed uh, that we included. Uh, uh, you in this presentation in a couple of the photographs and uh, um, and uh, yes. it's not that we deliberately did it because we wanted to get your support uh, but yeah, we figured sure. it wouldn't hurt we figured it wouldn't hurt um, <laughs> so um, uh, so um, so I, right. I, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm here to answer any additional questions you might have uh, but, but I, um, that's uh, great uh, and I love this presentation, and of course, we love having this team working on this. I think what we'll do is we'll open it up to questions, and we'll start with uh, members of our committee. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question or a statement. Uh, I see first, I see Coral Dawson. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I had a, 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 this looks great as an overall design. I appreciate the creativity that was put into it. I had, um, the trellises, I just wanted to make sure, and I mean, I know that you all have done such an amazing job with uh, all the horticulture that you've designed, but in the case of Vesuvio, the trellises were put in in a way that they could never sustain growth. And apparently that was done by design, by accident. And so when we had the hort come, they said there's just no way anything could actually grow on these trellises. So I just want to make sure that there's enough depth, breadth, and that horticulturally it can support the amount of growth that you want on those trellises, um, which I'm sure you've looked into, but since it wasn't looked into at Vesuvio and we have these ugly trellises that we can never plant, I wanna make sure that that's not an oversight in this case. And then my other comment is on uh, the cool, you know, mobile plaything. The the top part that has the light, if that's metal, it looks like it's not at all shaded. So I wanna make sure that there's some way that it's not gonna to get too hot. So that if people are you know, using it during the summer days, if they're not leaning against it and getting burned or anything like that, maybe it could be, I don't know, wrapped or something like that so that people can be comfortable, be on it like that child is in the picture, you know, hanging off of it and not get burnt. Thanks, Coral. Uh, we'll take questions from inside the room from our committee. Does anyone from our committee have Frederica? I think this is a wonderful presentation. It really, uh deals with and overcomes the, the constraints of the site. I, I bet you'll wish you had more of those spinning things when the park opens. I wanna, I wanna echo what Coral said about the trellises. Uh, the High Line had a trellis at 18th Street right by Edison, the Edison site. And even uh, before the construction started there, that trellis, nothing, nothing really ever prospered. And I'm reminded also of the original plans of the AIDS Memorial Park over by the St. Vincent's Hospital, where they wanted to completely plant that trellis. And they thought about uh, the toll that it would take to maintain it, and they decided to leave it unplanted. And I think that's, uh, I think that's pretty successful, just the way it is. I wish that we could go back to the site plan, and you could just point me to the edge that abuts the HPD site. Which is where uh, we anticipate a building to go. Right, and so is that at the at the top? Yes. Can I, can I hear from the team? Yes, the HPD site is up here yes. on north of this site. Oh, so my concern with having, those are, those are five trees across the top? Yes. Yeah, so my concern with that is that that really, draws a line between the residential area and the open area. And I wonder if it wouldn't be better to have a design at the top that worked 
better or had the potential to work better with whatever the design of the building is so that the, the open area would flow into the um, residential area. Are you worried that it will block windows or what? I'm just, I just feels very, it feels very structured to me and we don't know what the design of the building is gonna be yet. So it seems premature to be bisecting the, the site so completely and have it be so unflexible. It won't be able to respond to the design of the building. Thanks. Well, what, what we do know about the building um, is that it will be set back from the property line, as it were, oh. by feet. So the building won't be up against the uh, dividing line between this site and the HPD site. There will be a 10 foot setback. And, well, I don't think 10 foot is very much. And I, I don't know, I just feel like if you could, if there could be something that was a little less structured and a little more flexible that, that we, maybe ultimately when we see the design of the building, then what you have in mind would work with it. Given that we don't know yet, it seems like you're cutting a lot, cutting off a lot of opportunities. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the room on the committee? Uh, I have, yes, Shirley, go ahead. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with you, Frederica. Okay. I'm thinking that the trees they are going to provide a certain kind of scenery that will give enhance to that area, and that you do want some kind of vision between the structure and the open space. The way I see it, anyhow, I don't see it as um, what's the word? A strict division. I see it more as the trees being flowing into the other side. That's the way I see it. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, two comments. Uh, one is, I, I think that it, this is beautiful. That's not actually one of the two comments, but um, I, I have one concern, which is obviously this space is gonna be used by different people at different times of day, right? There's a school, there's a school, there's a high school, there's a building where children presumably will live. Um, I just wonder about the darkness at night in the Bosque Dell. Um, we just want to make sure that we are not encouraging nefarious uses and making the space scary. That that's mm -hmm. just one concern that I would have. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that I think that the constraints proposed uh, posed by the fact that it's a water tunnel site are also is presents an opportunity. I, I think that the building of our water tunnel is one of the great uh, uh, accomplishments of the city and our source of water is an incredible accomplishment of New York City. I would love to see personally a narrative element somewhere uh, that commemorated that and that allowed people to know where they were standing instead of just hiding it, but also you should know and be proud that you're standing on a site that uh, is bringing so much to New York City. That's, those are my feelings. Um, oh, wait, I, we have two other questions online. I see Rich. Yeah. Oh, and then no, I, no, I was, I'm okay. It's been covered. Uh, okay. Um, Shirley Secunda has another question. Oh, yeah. This is just this, I, I'm having problems visualizing the water tunnel area and what's going on there. Well, you mean like it's, it's manholes and a vent? Well, yeah, what's, what's going on around the manholes? What's, it, I didn't get a feeling. Oh, the, uh, they had the, uh, it was the tiles. Just like at Manuel Plaza, they have a, the tiles, permeable tiles. Mm -hmm. so they what they have no, what's the what about, and what about the area? circulation for people? Uh, I think you did, but you want to go, I mean, it's, it's I, I'm able to read it, but do you want to, um, do you want to, just show on the design where the the manholes are. Oh, that's yeah, there. And, and where there would be circulation and, and no, this this walking. hatch this hatch is an element of constraint. These two yeah. pipes are, and that's another. So those are the two hatches that were described. And then I guess right. the dots and many others are the manholes. Yeah, that I I see the, the limitations. What I'm asking, I guess, is. Okay, so you've got space. Does that mean people can walk around 
the manholes and, and I, pipes I presume and so on, on top of them. What was it? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm Alicia from DEP. Um, so yes, that space is absolutely open for circulation. Um, and I would love it, Michelle, if you could talk a little bit about the paving pattern, because I don't think you got too into that and the inspiration behind that. I think that's a really clever thing that you guys have been working on. Right. But, but yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. And isn't this, isn't this also an area where we're going to, the bid is going to be able to put out, uh, movable uh, tables and chairs? Um, Steve, we're working on the movable tables and chairs and the modulars, but yes, that's, that's the plan. Yeah, the paving pattern is actually um, partly inspired by the mural. And so we are looking, there's there's 10 long bands um, that define the mural with five faces. And we're looking at continuing that down into the ground plane and then looking at connecting all of the shade elements with these uh, more structured bands that run through the site. Um, this also allows us, like, you know, when kids are on site, it allows um, teachers to give something on the ground plane to give direction to, but also that you could potentially have fun with these. Um, you know, kids create games all the time. And so introducing a multicolored ground plane um, with different varied elements uh, was important to us in terms of supporting um, uh, unstructured play um, of a younger generation. Uh, uh, Carl, I see your hand up. I'm just gonna ask Rich if he wants to talk because yeah. he hasn't spoken yet. I'm sorry uh, the, to jump in front of Coral there. Um, there's a question that came up and I'm I'm sorry if it was answered during the design process, but this is now the third uh, water tunnel site uh, that that we've really designed or or been involved in the design of. And I'm wondering if there are anything from the first two that we learned about uh, about trying to work around the constraints and creating a space, and whether or not the use of it is has been as as we had hoped or we or as the designers thought uh, when when it was impl when it when they were created. And, and that it's sort of a leading question. Uh, the, the, what I'm saying is I think that what we've seen in the other ones was that the, the unstructured space has led to uses that were not necessarily expected. I, you know, we have people sending photos of, you know, kids playing soccer in there or dogs off leash or, uh, you know, people setting up badminton courts or I, I, I'm wondering if there's anything from that experience that we can, take into account with this design to try to limit those, assuming those aren't uses that we want or are not going to be allowed in this space. Does someone from the team want to address that? Whether there's any lessons learned from the previous, uh, I don't see any. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't uh, Maybe Alex should uh, respond is, uh, did you promote uh, Alex? Yeah, Alex Garbos? is there. Yeah, I see Alex is in there. I I uh, I put I see Alex is here and he is. Um, let me just double check. Uh, I think I you promoted him, right? Yeah, I'm sure. What is the space in the area that I don't know? So while Alex is maybe getting his audio working, I do want to say um, a big shout out to Alex because he did, he worked on those first two, he designed those um, two and they've just been, it's been so wonderful to see them in use. Um, and he's been an incredible partner with DEP um, and making sure that our folks have the access that they need to support the water supply. Um, and he's been just such a great help in guiding this design process as well with the benefit of his, his experience. Um, with the last two. So, Alex, are you around? Wait your turn. Alex, Alex is is he can he can talk or he can be promoted. Either one. If Alex, if you're there, you can answer. What? Yeah, because uh, because uh, Rich, I thought you had uh, elevated him. So let me. Yeah, look. he Alex. hasn't. He hasn't. He hasn't Alex. moved though. And uh, so I've okay. given him talking no. permission. He, he may be having a similar problem to the one that I had. Yeah. I need to jump out and jump in. Janine. Uh, uh, because I've tried to promote Alex. I've tried to promote you to panelist. And you have to accept it, I guess. Janine, I've uh, I've allowed you to talk. It was actually Janine that raised it to me. Uh, Janine, can you hear me? And can you, do you have anything to add? Uh, and she may she may not be able to either. Or she's uh, uh, it's a good time maybe to stop sharing the screen so we can see everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Why don't we come back to that when the people who can address it are able to communicate with us? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A- what was the question? I um, you know, I was raising Janine. I raised the question that you had raised to me on email about um, the previous water tunnel sites being designed and then sometimes being used um, in ways that were not anticipated uh, because the spaces are unstructured. Um, well, I, I mean, I love an unstructured um, park space because, you know, people can be really creative with it. I mean, I think of how J.J. Walker was used by all ages during the pandemic when there was no organized sports being played there. Um, and I was at the one on East 4th Street and I sent the picture to Rich and Susanna. Um, there were two kids um, basically kicking the soccer ball back and forth. Um, one had the goalie gloves on and one the other one was barefoot um, and they were um, and then there were these two um, elderly women um, playing badminton and um, I, I was trying to get an action shot but they were actually weren't very good um, <laughs> at the ball, um, they all they were picking it up a lot um, but I, I you know I always I've said this before I always love the um park down in Battery Park City on West Thames and um how I you know like you know that's got astroturf on it um or artificial turf on music um and uh but I'm just wondering if we can see you know more of, and I know that you designed that as well uh, um, that's your park um, and I know that's a different space and it's much larger and there's something for everyone there but um, I mean I, I see the common that it's meant to be a passive space define passive space um, there's no rule that it has to be a passive space the main requirement is that it's um, that you know the DEP if they need to can get into that space um, so uh, the East 4th Street Park has um, a center grassy area, and that's where the kids were playing. And um, when, you know, the park is not heavily used, but it's basically as a perimeter. There are people sitting on benches. It's illegally used by people um, as a dog run pretty much all the time. And, and then I see um, some children in there. Um, so it is used by, you know, different types. And I think you would see that, you know, it's not just a place to, you know, I was sitting there drink, drink, having a coffee on a nice Saturday morning, no different than an office worker eating their lunch, um, at three, uh, at the Hudson street park. But I just would like to see more flexibility, um, because when there's flexibility, people use spaces in all sorts of interesting ways. So I'm hearing two different things. Rich was actually raising a question about whether there were lessons to be learned from the other parks experience in terms of activities that we'd like to uh, disincentivize, uh, inhibit, uh, deter at this at this site, for example, maybe using it as a dog run. Whereas Janine is talking about the benefits of having a flexible space and that even with all the constraints, you have open space and people just play around and that's kind of great. Um, so I suppose the question to be asked of the team is simply, are there lessons from the other parts that that come to bear on this in terms of undesirable activities? Well, I'll step in and Alicia, I know, can um, respond more. Um, but the DEP uh, said that... Uh, um, structured active recreation is uh, not allowed. Dogs are not allowed. Um, but we have a different situation here because the bid is actively involved in helping to program and maintain this site. So whereas the other two sites do not have the benefit of this kind of oversight and management, I think it's far easier in this site to manage how flexibility is manifest as opposed to it getting taken over by uses that may be less desirable. That is a great answer. Um, I see Coral's hand up. I just want all the attendees to know that 
once our committee is done and, and our board, we're gonna go to the attendees. So have your questions ready and I'll just call on Coral. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I put some uh, suggestions in the chat, but separately I wanted to make sure that um, since you all are, are honoring the artwork that is on the side of the wall, that some contact has been made with the Argentine artist who did that. And if not, I can probably look back through my records to find her. I'm sure City of School has her uh, just to let her know, because I'm sure that would be like a very honorary, you know, it's very, um, it's lovely that you all are doing that. And I'm sure she would want to participate in some way to the opening to the park. So I just don't want to have that be an oversight because uh, you all are incorporating that work. And that's, I know something I think she did pro bono. Um, so that would be lovely. And we can yeah, that's a, follow. Uh, that's a, a very good idea. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah. And then uh, separately uh, on the music or uh, programming of the um, swinging areas, um, you may already have that in place, but uh, another example of a location that has done that very well is the Katy Trail in Dallas, Texas. They have um, spaces that you can walk by and it makes a noise, like, you know, chimes just for like an instant and are like a wind chime if you like walk by it. And it's a nice calming sound, but it's not, you know, um, it's it, it's definitely not something that would bother other people and it's it's specific to the location. So I'm sure you all have explored many, but uh, that's just one I want to make sure you all have on your radar because it's it's quite enjoyable and it's something they've incorporated um, throughout the Katy Trail. Thanks, Coral. Sure. Um, how about of our, atten our attendees? Does anyone out there have questions and would like to raise their hand? Like and Carter Booth, who is in the room. Uh, so um, the, the problem that I think, and Rich really was starting to speak to this a little bit, and Janine, with the other two tunnel sites, is they're not managed by anybody. So on slide 13 and slide 26, you, that's the area which, um, which Shirley was bringing up, is what happens there? And you kind of contradicted yourself a little bit and said we have to keep this totally open in slide 13, which are the truck access areas. And then in slide 26, you're, you are going in with a, a little bit more stuff there. But this this is sort of, I think, what everybody's comments are when you walk by the other site, nothing's happened. So what can happen there in a temporary fashion that still reach the mandate that the trucks can come? Because so casters, I think it's the stuff on casters, right? But it's not clear because that, I think that's our area we really want to comment on because that's the expanse that always ends up getting used by somebody else because it's there. So Carter is responding to the idea of an open space not necessarily being activated and asking what uh, what do the constraints permit in terms of activating that space? And I suppose one of the questions is those wheelie things that you showed us, are those allowed to be moved around or does, there, does everything have to be completely out all the time of the way that the truck would come in or is it okay if a truck driver had to shove those things out of the way? Okay, um, hey everybody, Alicia again from DEP. Um, those are great questions um, and it's, something that's been a primary challenge um, with all of these designs, right? Because, you know, first and foremost with these sites, these are part of um, the water distribution system in Manhattan. It's critical infrastructure um, yes. and we need to make sure that we can get to that. Um, and not just in an emergency, but we do um, multiple times a week come to the site um, for maintenance purposes. Um, so I'm sure you folks have seen DEP trucks come into the other sites um, and access that stuff. The infrastructure on each of these sites is in different places um, and the access routes are different. And that's kind of why each site is designed differently. Um, in this site, we have one vehicular access point. So we've got trucks that are pulling in and then backing out. Um, and it's really We've been working very closely with the Parks Department and the bid to figure out, and the designers, of course, um, to figure out solutions that will make this space be able to be, to do both things, right? To make sure that our operators aren't, you know, unreasonably uh, delayed um, in accessing the infrastructure. Keep in mind, there are many other sites that they need to do on their daily rounds. 
um, but also make sure that this is a usable programmable space um, for the community. And so we've been working to strike that balance. The modular furnishings with the casters, they are set towards the edges because they are a more hefty um, piece, of, piece of furniture. Um, the cafe tables and chairs, we will have more flexibility with. Oh, that's great. So, for, so in other words, the path that we saw before of where the truck has to go, it's not like you're going to have walls around that path. People are going to be able to move those little tables around and do that kind of thing. So that space can be activated. It doesn't have to be physically. And the, the bid is going to partner with us to make sure that when our operators come to the site, that that space is cleared um, so that they have the access and can get their job done. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, I see Janine. Um, yeah, I have a question just about that access one. I mean, I have some pictures. I'd have to pull them up and find them and happy to send them to you. But, um, you know, this winter there were, it seemed like 20 different vehicles associated, I think, with um, plowing and whatnot parked in that space, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and I guess the question, and so it sort of begs the question is like, realistically i mean obviously if there was an emergency you'd get 20 people out there one person would individually move all these trucks somewhere onto clarkson street um but realistically those trucks covered a greater proportion of the space than anything we'd ever envision in terms of um uh, open space design so what's the real story here in terms of access what's the what Real What's story. the real story in terms of access? Because when it, it's convenient, you can park 20 trucks there. Um, but when we're designing a park, you're we're telling us, oh, everything has to be movable so someone can access the space. And I something tells me the truth is somewhere in between. So that was a temporary par uh, parking situation that we um, did a little favor for our friends at the sanitation department who were displaced um, from their parking site during the snow season. Um, and they needed a place in the district to make sure that if there were a snowstorm, they could clear the streets um, in the district. So, so, we, so, and I think that I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, DSNY reached out to the community board too, to give you guys a heads up about that. But yes, those are the bright orange, uh, bright orange uh, plows and uh, uh, I don't know what you call them. The I don't think we're complaining. I'm not complaining that they were parked there. I'm just saying yeah, yeah. that they I, were. Yeah, I understand, your, I understand line. your question, Dean. But they were parked. <laughs> they were parked in coordination with our operators to make sure that we could get access on site. Um, and it was a temporary condition that was not um, not an ideal condition for for anyone, but had to be worked out uh, to make sure that we had could serve the community. So it's not part of the plan, but it's just an exception. Um, I'm going to ask Linda Franklin. Um, you have a question. Uh, you should unmute yourself, Linda, if you're there. There you go. Will there be access to the Plaza Square, direct access from the apartment building that's going to be built directly to the north? If I look at the square itself, the truck access is on the northwest corner, and it looks like the pedestrian access is on the south west corner will people living in that apartment building be able to access the square directly or will they literally have to walk around the corner i don't know if you're able to hear that uh it's about how people residents in the building would access the park would they have to sort of walk out onto hudson street turn a left and come in or how would they be able to access it um, I, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that there's, n they will not be permitted to have a private access point onto the open space, but we can. I'm sorry, you, you just repeat that because you felt as you came in and out of it. Oh, apologies. What's going on? No. Um, I want to confirm this, but my, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I'm just going to just mute Linda because there's some background noise. Go ahead, Alicia. Okay, so I want to confirm this for all of you, but my understanding is that there will not, the, that direct access from the building to the open space is not a permitted condition. So there will be the entry points to the open, to the affordable housing building will be on um, Hudson and Clarkson. 
Thank you. Uh, and of course, the building has yet to be designed. Linda, does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I muted you because you had a lot of background noise, but I didn't want to. I didn't mean to shut you off. Raise your hand if you if you still. Well, actually, I'll unmute you. No, never mind. I, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me. Let me. So unmute yourself, Linda, and go ahead. Thank you. Yes, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. The follow up is the buffer in this park, or is the buffer up the property? The 10 foot buffer? Yes. So uh, this goes back to a question um, that you raised earlier. Uh, you talked of a buffer zone between the park and the actual building, uh, a buffer zone of about 10 feet. Uh, and and Carter is asking if that buffer zone is taking away from the building lot or from the park lot. The building will have to be set back 10 feet from the property line based on the no drill zone ruling um, we have associated with our water okay. tunnel structure. Thank you. And I think we've talked about that at other meetings, so we can maybe. There's going to be a 10. <laughs> It's a, it's a 10 foot lane to the north of the park and it's 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 mandated by DEP constraints and will there be a fence no between the park and the buffer zone or do you know what that will look that border will look like between that's what you're right what will the border look like nothing has been designed yet um okay. thank you so but you don't know if it's going to be a wall or if it's going to be open we don't know that yet yeah, I have an add-on question to that. Go ahead. Um, I know we've asked this before, but I'm not going to willing to let it rest because ten feet is a lot in New York City. Um, the question is, is it because you can't drill with intent because of the size? If if it's a no drill issue, can the park part be ten feet bigger? I mean, it just seems a waste to have. Um, and it's my understanding that the plans for the ones in Hell Ki Hell's Kitchen. The building and the open space are there is no setback. So, what are the options here for using that space better? Can the building be bigger or the park be bigger? The lot lines are the lot lines, Janine, and things are being negotiated to make sure that we have the best possible solutions here for affordable housing, open space, and drinking water. Well, she's talking about lot lines. I don't know. I don't know what governs lot lines. Yeah, I mean the lot. It's all one lot. Um, I mean it hasn't been split, so I um, and it's somewhat arbitrary because it's changed over time. How do we make sure that that ten feet high? I mean I'm not sure how many square feet that is, but it's a sizable chunk. Um, is better used, and I'm and um, I think it would be helpful to continue to ask this question until the ten feet disappears. Or, or is used in a meaningful way. Great. Got it. So the question is, if if that ten foot buffer is to ensure that whoever's building the building doesn't drill down, fine. Perhaps that ten foot buffer could be given to the park, which has no intention of drilling down, and then we would get ten feet of nice space instead of just a empty breezeway. I think that's a. I think that's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Okie doke. And are there other questions? Yes, yeah, Shirley Sakana. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry if this is repetitive, but I think I just want a little more clarification about the access for the, the trucks and equipment for DEP. So barring emergencies, how often is there a schedule, in other words, for the trucks to access space? Alicia, what is the general pattern? Yeah. It's about two times a week. Um, the schedules do change, um, and that is by design. Um, and they're also, you know, they have to, they have a route and they have to hit up all the other shaft sites um, along the way. About two times a week. That's helpful. Um, I see three. On this point, what your comments on? They put up a slide yeah. and we can see it because they identify it as flexible space. But that's right. the space that's you want to know about a little bit more. 
think okay. that's where we run into the issue in the parks, big open expanses. Right. And we want them to be okay. used more uh, in the schedule. So Right. Let so, me see. We can go back and look at the flexible space and ask the question that we're asking. Uh, can you um, unmute yourself? There you go. Can I? Um, can you speak louder or closer to the mic? Uh, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, I live near Rapkin Gale. I uh, use it periodically. A uh, couple of questions in regard to what we ended up getting at Rapkin Gale, which changed quite a bit from this point in the discussion to what actually was installed there. Um, first, the lawn area is artificial lawn. If you could speak to the possibility that that will be the um, answer at Hudson Houston. Also, the pavers are very, they're permeable. They're rough. They're not a flat surface, um, which is very good for uh, restricting skateboarding and other activities within the area. I'm not sure how you reconcile that surface with the idea of moving wheeled heavy objects about. Um, so if you could speak to those two items, I'd appreciate it. So uh, just to, uh, we'll go back to some drawings now. You're asking about the pavers themselves and you're asking about the, the green grass or whatever, the, the ground cover. Sure. The turf. Uh, and and Carter and Shirley are asking about the flexible space in the middle. So maybe we can, can you guys go maybe back to that slide or those slides and we can address those questions. There you go. Okay, um, Signe here. Um, I can address uh, the, we do not, we are not proposing any synthetic turf. The green bands that you see under the trees are planted with uh, ground covers and uh, that those beautiful drawings that you saw about the seasonal diversity. So there is no synthetic turf. In Spray. terms of permeable pavers, uh, we are obligated uh, to maintain 100% permeability on this site. And it's being done in two different ways. One is with the um, permeable pavers that you uh, pointed out are used in Rapton Gale and uh, the other site, uh, and then uh, an an aggregate in a in a grid. Um, yes, it is a deterrent uh, to skateboarders. Uh, we do not imagine there's going to be wheeled. It's certainly not a deterrent to a vehicle, uh, like a like a DEP truck. Um, they are completely ADA accessible. The joint width meets all of the universal accessibility. Um, so, are they, uh, did they pose any difficulty for any of those mobile uh, elements that are on wheels on casters? No, the caster design is the diameter of the wheel, which is being designed uh, to span that joint dimension with no difficulty. So my understanding is that what you're saying is that the papers are intentionally not super smooth because you want to discourage uh, skateboarders. And they are certainly smooth enough for moving around the, the, the elements that are foreseen for the site. Is that right? Well, I wouldn't say that the driver is a uh, skateboard deterrent. It's really the driver is permeability and stormwater capture. Hudson Square has a history of uh, a lot of flooding and uh, and it's also DEP's request that we capture as much stormwater as we can. The side benefit of the permeable pavers is that they also act as a bit of a deterrent to a wheeled um, 
person. Thank you. That's very helpful. Pete, does that answer your question? Not a wheelchair. Could you bounce a ball? Yes, it does. Um, Can you bounce a ball without going haywire? Sorry. Yes, you could. Okay. Pete, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Now you have muted yourself. Did you? Uh, he said he's. No, I'll, I'll let you guys go ahead. I, All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. So now just to get back to this question that I'm not quite clear about that Carter and Shirley were discussing. The black on the screen, which is hard to read, that says flexible space is in blue on the right side. In so blue. Now, the third section down, yeah. So that yeah. refers to that right big here? open area. And that big open area, if you go um, to slide 29, which you've had a rendering of, can you hear me? Yeah, so there, you see it's big and open. And this is the frustration that I hear with the other two parks. But in this case, we have the bid damaging, right? And this is the totally different elements, this part. And right. so the question is, how is this space better used because it's so big? And it's talked about in generic terms, but like what's funding and what can actually be put out each day, who can take it away? Can DEP come to some better agreement with the bid that this is actually used? Because that's, this is the area that nothing can be placed in. And so back to your first slide. So what we would like to see, I would think, is a better arrangement and activation of the space with some agreement so there's better expectations down the road that's mapped out now, um, particularly with the bid's involvement, so that we have a a, a, a really good space and even if that's seating but what how can that be worked out in a better fashion instead of what we've heard at the other two sites which is nothing can be here but isn't that the point of the things on casters and the cafe too no, they just said they can't, no, we can't move. Guys, can i just from the bids perspective chime in for a second um just want to say we share your um your interest and priority in having as much seating as possible um, DEP has actually been a great partner um, in working with us because we will be on site and we are planning on being there regularly and we can, we will have our workers there to move things when needed. So we are optimistic that some of the movable furniture, the modular furnishings on casters are something that our team would be able to move into different configurations. So for example, if the school wanted to set up a little mini classroom in part of it, that we could help them with that, that we could have the cafe tables and chairs um, as we do in Spring Street Park and Freeman Plaza's. So we're trying to replicate that model as much as possible within the restrictions on the site that DEP has. So we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I can assure you that's something we're talking about a lot. And our goal is to get to an agreement with DEP where we can use that space as flexibly as possible. That's great. So what we're seeing here, which looks like a large empty space, and of course it's exaggerated by perspective, won't actually necessarily be empty at all. It, uh, because you're, you're, there's all kinds of flexible furniture that can be moved around. And you're confident that with working with DEP and having the bid involved, that there'll be a lot more activity. Maybe like not in the truck path, but they were saying off to the side, but maybe not in that sense. But if, if you go back, this is the- No, I know, I, I know you're talking about the- blue What we're area. hearing is trust us instead of a plan. And this is the whole point okay. of why the bid is managing it. And that's why we want to get the conversation out now because what it is in the end is not going to be about as far as we would like actually And they actually uh, have to Rich and Pete. Uh, Frederica Siegel's in the room and then we'll go to Rich Capitola. Samara, I want, Samara, I wondered what you thought about uh, Janine's comment about taking that 10 foot wide no drill. Did you say goodbye? No, uh, I don't know where you are. Samara, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. Um, so taking that 10 foot no drill zone and making it a part of the park with all of the necessary um, constraints. constraints that it would have. What do you think about what Janine was talking about? Um, so Alicia, I don't know if you want to jump in again, right? This is DEP property in an agreement with parks in the bid. Um, we're working to make it as wonderful a space as possible, but the details of, in terms of what the what DEP needs to use the site for, like that's that's a DEP question. 
Um, I, I do believe, and I, I'm not totally sure about this community board, you guys will know this better than me, but I think you're soon going to be having um, a, a committee meeting where you're going to talk more about the north side of the site. So, you know, that I, I imagine that this is a conversation that will be continued then, but I don't really have any information on that myself. Okay, well, then I'll, I'll go back to Alicia and say that I, I hope that there can be some interagency cooperation between uh, DEP and parks and HPD to make the most out of that 10 foot wide swap. It's it's pretty long and it adds up to a lot. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, to touch on the, both that point and, and yours. You use the word perspective. That image that we were looking at that was just taking down the, the design that perspective is really misleading i mean the, the space is not that big to show the the umbrellas as such small can you can we put that one back up again and it, it's, it's so small in there it makes it look like they're far away the space is not that big i mean, the, I mean it makes it how far is it across i mean it, remember there are two murals there today one is now replaced by the image that is a, in the image will be the building it's about 85 feet away. So from where this person is standing at the entrance, it's about 85 feet to get to the back of the site. I, I, I just, I don't think it, I mean, it makes the, the, the umbrellas look as though they're very far away. And and the truth is there's not that much space here that's un, uh, that's that's going to be open, truly. I mean, if, if you go back to the one that shows the arc at the beginning, um, it's just I, I don't I mean if, if somebody's playing it's it's not that big a space if kids are kicking a ball they're gonna end up hitting somebody if someone's you know yeah uh, do you have the the first one or, or the second one the one that shows the arc of the of that one yeah yeah I just um and we're looking from Houston looking up Hudson that it's it's not that uh I just I I think there's just not that much. I think the picture is misleading. The the last one. It's just not that much space here for activities. When you uh, look at um, I'm trying to think of a picture, the picture of, of of the site today with the two murals. I I just called one up. I have a picture on my phone of it. It's not. Um, we're we're talking about a lot of 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 a lot here. It's just not that much space. So you're saying that. Yeah. It, the, the concern about it being empty and unactive right. is is not should it shouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that's what I'm saying. I just don't think yeah. it's going to if the if the tables are there and the umbrellas are there, there's not going to be that much um, additional um, empty empty stuff that's going to look like it's you know not active. Um, again, you, you're you're seeing if you look at this picture here, it's going to end at the fourth face, right and the 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 other yeah. mural is going to be hidden. It's not. It's really not that big a space uh, once you cut it in half. You know, uh, Pete Davies. I'm going to. Yeah. Um, could you just speak to the any restriction on commercial activity that will be allowed within the open space? Um, Alicia is There's, having, yeah, you got it. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. my phone, so I apologize. My computer is disagreeing with me. Um, so there's no commercial um, business on on the plaza itself. Right. And no keeping, I think, Steve with parks rules, right? No food carts, no trucks, no, no ice cream vendors, nothing like that. No private tennis lessons. No nope. questions. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Uh, I don't see any more questions in the room or online. So uh, I would just thank you all very much for this presentation. I'm hoping that you can send it to us. Uh, if, the, if you could send us the PowerPoint to Rich or to me or to both of us or to him, really, uh, that would be really helpful uh, as we write up a report. And um, uh, thank you, as always, for your you know innovative ideas and for trying to make the best of us of a space that has a lot of constraints. 
Uh, thanks very much. I think we'll say good night to you guys and we'll go on to, oh, what, oh I must go on to uh, Will Morrison, who I hope has come back from drinking his Negroni. So good night, guys. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, uh, we, we are hoping that uh, you'll uh, be passing a resolution on this site. Okie doke. It, uh, it, we it, add that on that our agenda. Yeah, to that end, can, uh, Steve, can you just tell us what the next uh, step would be in the process? Um, well, I, I mean, uh, I mean uh, Signe or uh, Michelle might be able to confirm this, but uh, I believe that uh, we would be taking this to a PDC. That's correct, Steve. Public Design Commission. Okay. Yes. Correct. Great. Okay. And um, you know, and uh, and they'll be uh, certainly interested in any resolution that's passed by the community board. Okie dokie. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Here's Will. Will's here. Yeah, I, I missed the Negroni joke. Sigmi, are you still there? Sigmi, is anyone from the bid there? Did we lose you? Oh, you're all gone. We'll, we'll have to ask them offline. Oh, Steve, Steve, do you know when you're submitting to PDC? No, I'll have to find out. Okay, thanks. We, uh, we are looking to submit for the July submission, so it goes in in June for the July meeting. Okay, tell us how our date is. June 20th. Our full board will be meeting on June 20th, so you will have a resolution by that. We hope that's in time. Uh, that yeah. Okay. Could be right. That would be great. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank yeah, you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, let me talk to you. Be uh, tomorrow. I got a couple of minor corrections before we send the uh, presentation to the, to the board. Okie doke. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, we're gonna go to Will, who I hope has had a nice time. Hi. Yes, I have. Uh, it's been <laughs> it's been so enjoyable. Um, <laughs> No, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, thank you. Um, I will. I'll start by going into you know the events and and programs and volunteering uh, that's going on this season, and then if if there's time, I'd love to give a few other non non event related updates. Um, the, it is a busy time at Washington Square Park. Um, I would start with a you know kudos. They're not here, but the first iteration of the. Washington Square Music Festival kicked off yesterday and it was wonderful. It was a beautiful night, um, excellent uh, performance and, uh, you know, it was a full crowd. So it was, it was great to see um, that the music festival is in the square in Garibaldi Plaza uh, every Tuesday in June. Um, with this Friday, we have the French films on the green returning to the park and that'll be both this Friday and the following Friday. This Saturday is the Hare Krishna Festival. Um, that, you know, the, the, the big one, uh, they're parading down, uh, to the park and have an entire festival set up there for the day. On Sunday, we have our, uh, drawing series in the Northwest corner, um, uh, drawing the great elm tree by, uh, the folks at Tree Wonder. Uh, next Saturday or Sunday, depending on the moon sighting, will be the Id al Adha, uh, prayer service in the morning. Um, that'll be, that'll get finalized two or three days out. Um, on Saturday, June 22nd, we have an ancestral remembrance celebration in Garibaldi Plaza, celebrating uh, the African-American history of the park and the village. Um, we have some 16 millimeter film screenings on June 24th. That's a Monday and Saturday, July 27th. Of course, it's Pride Month. And at the end of June, there are pride festivities, both formal and informal, that take place at the park. Um, and then we have uh, so far in August confirmed on the calendar, our folk festival that takes place on Saturday, August 25th, and an NYC Parks movie under the stars evening on Tuesday, August 20th. Um, I am, those are highlights. I am not including all of the various folks that get special event permits for birthday parties, event performances, and other types of events at the park, um, of which there are many. Um, but those are some season highlights. And I would be um, remiss if I did not go into um, some of the weekly programming offerings uh, that the Conservancy hosts in the park, whether it's um, adult and senior movement on Tuesday mornings or yoga on Wednesday mornings, had a great session this morning, um, or fitness classes in the mornings on Thursdays, or whether it's um, uh, 
uh, a tonk, which we are bringing back uh, uh, to the park, La Boulet New York A's, which used to do host tournaments way back in the day. Um, we're partnering with them to bring them to the park on Wednesdays at noon. Um, Salsa Socials on Wednesday evenings, uh, Double Dutch Thursday afternoons um, in the northwest corner. We've got on first Fridays, we're partnering with a local game cafe, Hex, to bring a games afternoon to the park um, where you can play play games at the tables in what is formerly called Scrabble Plaza. Um, and we also have an artist residency program there on Saturdays. The current uh, artist is doing a sculpture activity, and uh, it was great fun. Uh, this past Saturday. And this week, uh, the kids programming is launching. Um, it's kids uh, story time on Tuesdays, art in the park on Wednesdays, art meets books on Thursdays, and then movement and music classes on Fridays for both uh, early childhood uh, aged children and then older kids. Um, the We also, of course, uh, have volunteering programs. Every second Saturday of the season, we have an open community cleanup. Very easy to remember. Come on out, um, uh, help keep Washington Square Park uh, nice and safe and beautiful. Um, and we also have uh, distinct cleanup events. So we're in the second year of hosting a uh, volunteer cleanup open to anybody the day after Pride, uh, uh, the Pride Sunday. So uh, that would be Monday, July 1st this year. But it was a great success last year. We had a lot of people show up um, and really help uh, help clean the park on that Monday morning. And I would encourage encourage folks to come. Um, go, moving into some other park updates. Um, I'm gonna start with some horticulture updates. For those that have noticed, we have changed around our entrance beds, the four beds. They are now uh, planted with native perennial plants. Um, again, you know, the, um, uh, I actually loved the presentation earlier. It was so nice to see. We have some of those same plants in these corner beds. So it was great to see um, some of those options present. Um, and I and I do need to shout out the Conservancy again, who funds all of our horticulture plant horticultural plantings at the park. Um, the uh, we've also uh, replaced native plant uh, some garden beds with native plants in other parts of the park, including the area behind the stage at Garibaldi. Uh, the Thompson Street entrance, both of the parterres are planted with anemone canadensis, which was in that presentation. So again, really cool to see uh, some familiar plants in that presentation. Um, I would be, uh, I have to mention our very sad tree removals that have occurred over the past week. We had uh, forestry uh, comes in and inspects all of our trees and makes decisions based on the health of the trees. We did have uh, a white ash tree that uh, has stood by the dosa cart that's been there for a long time. It was suffering from emerald ash borers and, and forestry made the decision to remove that tree. And then in Garibaldi Plaza, we had an American elm that unfortunately during last week's deluge uh, had a major limb drop occur uh, overnight. And upon a further inspection, forestry again, you know, assessed the health of the tree and it, 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 it needed to be removed. Uh, determined that it needed to be removed. Um, on the more positive spin with trees, though, we have welcomed eight new street trees to the perimeter of the park this season, and I'm working with forestry on new in-park tree plantings that would be coming this fall and spring, um, or following spring, spring of 2025. Of course, you know, now adding, you know, uh, consideration for these two locations where the trees were removed. And of course, our lawns that we closed two lawns a season to renovate them, rejuvenate the grass, those are now open uh, to the public once again. Um, on the maintenance front, uh, the bathrooms are open until 8 p.m. seasonally, like they are, again, with the support of the Conservancy, we're able to fund an, a night crew to keep those restrooms open and keep the trash cans getting emptied regularly until 10 p.m. throughout the summer season. Um, the, uh, we have also a, a kind of a fun one, uh, we upcoming, uh, we're going to have a vendor in the park. This is being led by art and antiquities. They're going to be doing a scan of the Washington square arch with drone technology, um, which is really cool to try and, uh, get a capture, a 3d map of it is my understanding to try and anticipate maintenance problems with it. Um, that's going to be a really cool project coming on the horizon. Um, we focused on doing a deep clean of all the fountain piping this spring. If you, have walked by and maybe noticed it's very this is very in the weeds but i really love this kind of stuff like it, the jets have all been cleaned properly all of the piping downstairs have been cleaned properly 
it's awesome. The Jets are the Jets are in great order. I've been really wanting to do that for a while. So um was really pumped to get that done. And uh through funding uh, to the Conservancy, we also added 10 more trash cans to the park to try and help um with the trash needs of the park um, and keeping litter in the cans and off the ground. Um, moving into quality of life, uh, I do uh, want to uh, discuss the Northwest Corner. And specifically, you know, folks may have noticed uh, in the past since uh, uh, May, Tuesday, May 25th, there has been a market increase in uh, multi-agency activity there. And that's the result of something called a community link task force. And it's led, led by City Hall. Um, it's a community link is a multi-agency effort uh, being brought to bear in the northwest corner um, uh, of the park at present. And it's instigated as a result of concerns um, uh, for and awareness of the direct community outreach that's been done to parks, to other agencies, to City Hall directly. And City Hall has been listening and has been planning and has, has really uh, come uh, to understand those concerns and is responding with this coordinated effort. So to go into what it is, um, the Community Link is essentially a multi-agency effort that includes city, city hall representatives coordinating uh, mul multiple divisions of the NYPD, parks, us, parks, parks enforcement, Department of Homeless Services, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, and uh, multiple other uh, supporting agencies as needed if they find a specific task that's, in, that's within a, an agency's uh, jurisdiction. And those, what those actions really mean on the ground is the daily multi-agency coordination meetings actually on site. So meeting at, at the site, assessing the needs on a daily basis, increasing the amount of uh, resources at the park in terms of NYPD and Parks Enforcement uniformed presence from early in the morning through the closing of the park at midnight, um, and uh, consolidated cleaning efforts with our maintenance uh, teams, um, Department of Sanitation, if we need their assistance, um, and also, of course, uh, with Department of Homeless Services and the Department of Health and Hygiene, uh, daily social service outreach with trained nurses on site, which is a which is a step up that we that we haven't had in the past. Um, and it's it has really um, it's been in my four year almost four years now at the park, um, which is hard to believe. Um, the uh, it is it is the you know the most amount of resources I've seen deployed. Um, it's really encouraging. Um, I'm I'm so thankful to both you know parks agency leadership and the leadership at City Hall for recognizing the community's concerns and and bringing this community link task force to the park. And as I said, it's been here through it's been here through Tuesday, May 25th. It will keep going, and uh, progress will continue to be monitored out of the leadership at City Hall. Um, and I did want to add an addendum to that because it, it was picked up in the press totally separate from this community link task force. We, the revenue division of, of parks uh, did issue an RFP um, that included a location in the Northwest corner for a specialty cart. Um, a specialty cart means a cart that has a more creative culinary menu and mobile unit design than your standard hot dog and ice cream cart. I'm sure many on this Zoom are familiar with the distinction, but for those that aren't like a great example of another one that's already in the park is the DOSA, the DOSA cart um, by the Sullivan Street entrance. So it's um, requesting proposals for other ones like that. We are currently in the selection and evaluation process. We'll look to finalize that evaluation uh, by this summer and plan for it to begin operating, hopefully um, in the late summer, early fall, pending their registration and and getting every all of their ducks in a row. Um, but those, uh, the, I definitely wanted to cover that. Um, and, you know, I'm in the interest, uh, it's 8.30. I know it's been a long meeting for all. I, I will end it there and open it up to questions that folks might have, because I know I, I went through a lot pretty quickly there. Um, I have a couple of uh, comments and questions. First of all, I'm, I'm so happy to hear about this community link. Uh, this issue of homelessness and substance use and mental illness was, we named it one of the top priorities for CD2. Uh, so it's very encouraging to hear the city respond to it. Uh, I have, as it happens, I chair the Human Services Committee, so I may talk to you offline about a time that it would be good to bring them into our committee to see what, what they're finding. And the other thing I wanted to say on that topic is that Human Services, at the end of July, will be hosting Bridget Brennan, who chairs the Office of Special Narcotics for the DA's office. 
Uh, and one of the topics that we want to discuss, obviously, is trends in Washington Square Park. So I don't know if you want to join us in that meeting. We can talk about this offline. But I wanted to let you know that that's an area of interest for the Human Services Committee. I'd, then, I'd be happy to. And Bridget's part of the Community Link Task Force. The, the, yeah, the, the Special Prosecutors right. in our office and the DA's office are both oh, part of that Community Link. That's great. So we're doing that at the end of July. I'll tell you more about that. I had just one other little thing that I wanted to say. I was walking down the street one day and there was a group of like five teenagers and they were looking for a place to go use the bathroom. And I said, if you go one block north, you'll find Washington Square Park. There's a confrontation there. And it was the middle of the day and they said it's closed. Um, so these poor kids who, you know, were, no one is going to let them into their restaurant to use the bathroom. It, how often do the, does the conversation close during the day? What is that? Was that an exception? Is that? I would say the most likely answer, the Occam's razor, is that they they happen to stop by at a time when we clean them because we do periodically need to clean them. I mean, if we think about it, the bathrooms in Washington Square Park, if you know, depending on uh, which one they're using, there's only three stalls in one restroom and one stall in another and 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 two urinals. Right. And it's the only restroom in the heart of Greenwich Village. So it, we yeah. to keep it in a serviceable standpoint, we do have to clean it throughout the day. And in some points of the day, it is more efficient to close it for a short period of time to have an effective cleaning so we can open it. So I totally that appreciate that. And that makes a lot of sense. I hope that you're able to just communicate that while you're doing it so that youngsters who, you know, whatever people we, might know, it is the only public toilet in the long we absolutely do. We have we have big we have a big red sign that goes out, and we have right. uh, we have people on the team that are standing there and and usually giving an ETA of when it's back open. All right. Next time I see a group of kids looking to pee, I'll tell them to just hold their horses and wait for the thing to open again. Um, I see a hand up on panel's coral. Uh, yes. Um, I am thrilled with all the programming. I wanted to ask whether you have um, sort of like a downloadable app or calendar where people can absolutely. Okay. So yeah, the the particularly for the programming on the conserve on our website for the cons for the Washington Square Park Conservancy, which is WashingtonSQPark.org. Um, you, it's all there under our happenings page, and I um, will absolutely send it both to Mark. I can put it in the chat. Once I'm done speaking or a coral, you can absolutely email me and I'll I'll send you all the information. No, I'm happy to do that. Is it in an app or somewhere that people can download it on their phones? It is. No, it's a, it is an online website. Um, okay, the, but, so I will try to get it onto ours so we can figure that out. But I'll talk to you offline on that. Great. And also on, on yeah, the bathrooms. Um, yeah. So I'm going to suggest an attendant because the last time I was there, there were multiple people, multiple girls going into one stall. Mm -hmm. So, which is an issue to begin with. And um, I think that's only preventable with some an attendant actually on site the whole time. And that might actually help too with the cleaning situation and just with all situations. So I don't know if that's possible, but I think that would be like a priority for the conservancy and for any funding because I haven't been in the last few weeks, but the times I have been, there have been issues going on in the girls' bathroom that I don't think are necessarily helpful to anyone. And um, I don't know how to like mitigate that without an attendant there. So I'm just suggesting that. And well, yeah. may, I, may, I, it, may I tackle that one first? So I do actually want to be clear. The So the Conservancy does actually already fund two bathroom attendants that is the, that is the that are dedicated to cleaning those bathrooms and are the people that close them throughout the day um, to clean them. But when you talk about a an attendant that's keeping folks out of bathroom stalls, that's that falls more under the parks enforcement officers duties, which they do do. But they have to be the parks officers are also patrolling the park, addressing conditions. So if there's a condition at the restroom, the call will go out for them to come to the restroom to address that situation. And it is totally feasible to stop by that restroom and, and see multiple people in the restroom with parks enforcement on the way or in the process of being called. Um, but it is something we I, deal but with. It's, I mean, it's pretty normal for like if you go into a women's bathroom anywhere, if there's an attendant for the person to be able to say only one person per stall. I, like, I, I think the person needs to be like physically in the bathroom. And that yeah. would actually like probably reduce the amount of cleaning and other situations that you will have to deal with. If you have someone posted in the bathroom. And 
I mean, I, I feel like that's like very old school, but like it would make a huge difference because then everybody that's also in the bathroom is, you know, impacted by what's going on in the bathroom. And I understand it's difficult to deal with, but like, it's, it's not really. Cause like, if you go to any nightclub or whatever else, there's an attendant in the bathroom, making sure two people don't go in the bathroom. Like it's just, so I just suggest that. And um, then in terms of religious politics, how are you all handling that? Because I understand the Hare Krishna is one thing, but do you all have a policy right now in terms of how you are handling like any religious, antics at the site of um you know a public park can you can is you there a policy or are you like can you define yeah. a religious antics um a religious group gathering mm -hmm. on park sure. what is the policy right now so parks is content agnostic so the way it's dealt with is through our special event permitting system so like for example the Hare krishna festival is a <laughs> permitted uh special event that's actually handled at the citywide special events office because of how large it is uh, and is multiple multiple agencies, street permits, parade permits, parks permits. Um, for example, the prayer service that I mentioned that's coming up uh, either next Saturday or Sunday, depending on the moon sighting, they too file a special event permit well in advance um, and it's handled by way of issuing the permit. Uh, same thing if there is an if there are gatherings like a protest, for example, there are protest permits one can get. Um, and for protests that are spontaneous that that don't get a permit or really, you know, occur spontaneously, that coordination is handled uh, between parks and NYPD um, in terms of just coverage. Um, no, but I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah that, I, I would love for you all to have a permit only policy so that that you know everyone has to respect the same rules and the same respect for the space but that's just that's me um then the last thing is so i have lived in the area for over 25 years that northwest corner i mean when i was in college before i even lived here has been an issue so i feel like you know um somehow for now 30 years this is just sort of like in some way been like some not permitted but like accepted and I think that's got to change like that's got to change radically because every year we talk about the northwest corner and we kind of like try to like make sure no one dies there but it's still a problem and so I would just challenge you to think about like that doesn't need to be that way anymore there's no value add to our community to having a drug dealing area with people like overdosing in that corner <laughs> and I mean, I, I literally came up, I remember in 1994, I came up and visited and I was, you know, offered drugs in that corner as a college student. It's like we're now, now in like 2000, you know, 24. So I just would hope you would take a stronger action to make sure that that's <laughs> not the identification of that corner for the next 20 years. Thanks, Carl. Um, we're gonna go to Janine, and I should say that I was offered drugs when I was twelve in that park. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's like it's crazy. It's it's yeah, it's like just so accepted. Uh, well, it's yeah. I mean, anyway, Janine, go ahead. Um, I I am I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious if you mean when lots of people are. I just should. I'll just ask for all offline. Um, but I do think that the bathroom, I want to preface this with, I will use any bathroom and regularly use the ones in Washington Square Park before they were renovated, um, especially when I was pregnant um, with my kids. But I actually went to use the bathrooms last week and they were there were two women shooting up and I didn't go in there. So um, how do we, you know, allow them to be public? as well as reasonably safe. And I guess that's my main question. Sure. Thank you. And I would answer that, you know, with that is an issue that we do experience at the restrooms and when our narcotics are involved and occupying those restrooms, it is an enforcement matter. So it is it starts with parks enforcement that are fixed post at the park. If they are aware of the issue, they are either handling it at their level, or they are requesting assistance from NYPD, which they frequently need to do. 
Um, so again, you know, going back to the Northwest corner for a moment and the community link team, you know, I think we are this summer providing some novel approaches to try and tackle the Northwest corner and those issues, which do interplay with the restroom. You know, the, the, the park is not, no section of the park is in a <laughs> vacuum and having the additional uniformed enforcement presence on site makes it so that if there is an issue in the restrooms, it, we can get a more quick response from our partners at NYPD if the situation warrants it. Um, and th those are the types of issues that the parks enforcement officers deal with every day at Washington Square Park. Thanks, Will. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments? I see that Catherine Swan is here and you usually have uh, some input and there you are. Here, uh, let me allow you to talk, Catherine. Go. Catherine, I'm gonna lower your hand and you can talk. You're not muted, but we're not hearing you. Uh, hmm. Are you hoping? All right. I'm going to, uh, if you come back online, let me know if there's something that you wanted to ask or say. Put it in the chat. Meantime, uh, no, she's not in the chat. Is there anybody else uh, either in the room or online? Um, Okie doke, guys. Uh, Will, thanks a lot for that. Lots of information. Uh, we're now going to go into business session. Anyone who would like to linger may, but the conversation will be uh, exclusive to this committee and uh, the board. And, oh, hi, I don't know why you can't hear me. I don't know why I can't hear you either. If maybe, no, she can't post in the chat. That's right. So she just posted something in the chat. I don't know why. Can she ask the question in the chat? Can you ask the question in the chat? Uh, I just had one question. Yes. Okay, good. Type it in, baby, and we'll get an answer. Link went up for you. Uh, who can see your message? It's recording. Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't know what's up, but thank you for noticing me. Sure, go ahead. If you don't mind typing your question, we'll do it that way because I don't know what the glitch is. And it's getting on, and we still have to do business sessions. So I'm going to presume that you're typing right now. I'll give you a few seconds. There you go. I actually wondered what happened with the historical signs in the park. Okay, great. Will? Uh, that's a great question. So yeah, we the Art and Antiquities Division has been uh, reviewing all of their... So that the Art and Antiquities Division writes the content of historical signs, not just at, our, at Washington Square, but at all, all across the signs on all parkland. Um, and I've been working with them. They've been they've been making and refining the uh, uh, new signs uh, for each of our plazas. So Garibaldi and Holly, um, as well as uh, the ones that used to be at the arch on the northern entrance. And so while you know they once they are done with that process, those would be printed at our in-house sign shop and placed back at um, at those sites. And they will look very similar to what's uh, posted on the park house now next to the headstone. Um, uh, that's mounted uh, just inside the park house. Catherine, if you have a follow-up question, just type it in. I would just like to commend your observational talents. <laughs> uh, I'll give you 10 seconds to see if you're typing in a follow-up question and otherwise. One thing with the history of that was that the community board was supposed to review it. Okay. I'd be more than happy to send the community board um, the content of those signs. Um, I have to check with Art and Antiquities because, again, they come they come out of their shop. But if you actually look on the park's website on each page, on the uh, go to the park and you can see articles in the Art and Antiquities section on each monument, the copy is essentially abridged versions of those articles. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for the question. We're going to go into business session. Uh, and, oh, do you know what kind of food cart may come into the Northwest Center? I'm going to um, I'm going to guess it's going to be a, uh, you don't know yet. Not uh, I, I have seen the proposals, but I am not at liberty to share. Uh, that okay. would not be fair to the proposers. Um, we will wait and see then. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks to everybody who came and, uh, contributed the conversation about Washington Square Park. Uh, we'll say good night to uh, to Will and to anybody else who wants to leave. And well, if you'd like to stay and just listen in, you're welcome to do so. Did you have a question, sir? No. 
just many bells. Wow. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, Thank you. It's great to see all of you. Guys, uh, we will not take questions or comments from anyone outside the board. Rich, do you want to lead this part or no? Want to keep going? Go ahead. No, and, and thanks for texting and thanks for Therese. I, I see her point. No, keep yeah, going. Thank you to Steve. I see Steve here. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we've been asked to do a pass a resolution on the plans for the uh, the water signal site at Hudson and Houston. Uh, I think what we'll do in this conversation is sort of make comments and then, Rich, you can uh, distill everything. Uh, okay. Comments from the committee. Yes, well, surely. The 10 feet. The 10 feet. Okay. <laughs> Everyone is concerned about the 10 feet. Yeah. And of course, I was thinking yeah, for the parkland. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in it becoming parkland. Of course, I've asked myself once you have a building there, you might need a place to put garbage cans. That would be, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, but there is interest in knowing how that space can be maximized, whether it's for the use of the building or the use of the park. But we want to make sure that it's not just a dead breezeway. Um, and well, I, that will require some coordination. Please, so maximizing is a great word because it leads to the other thing that we were discussing, which is the space where the pipes are and the access and how can that be maximized. So we want so, to emphasize the interest in having as much activated as possible with movable uh, elements uh, that and, and carefully managed by the bid. and carefully managed by the bid so that we can have as much activity in the park as possible. Another um, another issue that was brought up was the, would the plantings grow up on the trellises? Would they be appropriate plantings with enough soil to be able to act both of them? Right. I don't know if you heard that, Rich, but there were a number of people who said that in other cases where trellises have been installed, they haven't worked so well. But just to make sure that that's the case. <clears throat> I would like to put in a pitch for my idea, or my idea, my interest, not my idea, my interest in having a narrative element that tells everybody where we are, oh. since it's such a wonderful yes. place to be. Janine? Um, oops. Yeah, um, obviously a 10 foot. Um, I would like to, Pete asked a good question. I just think I would like to reiterate that we were told that there was no commercial use. And what we didn't ask that I'm thinking is what about corporate events and activations like we see in the um, meatpacking district and so forth. Um, so I, I kind of want to say we don't want any commercial use or corporate events and activation. However, if they are, then where does the money go? And I think, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think it should go to, I, I think it should go to city as school, but that's my personal opinion. But it should it shouldn't just go back to the bid because then they'll just it'll be like the meatpacking bid and they'll just be events all the time. Well, you know, actually that's that would have been a good question to ask because the fact that it's being managed by the bid raises a question about whether the bid has the authority to close it to the public on occasion for reasons belong to the bid. I'm gonna guess that they don't. It's not a not for profit, it's not a conservancy, but we don't actually have an answer to that. So maybe since we didn't ask it an answer it. We should just make yeah. note of it. Money. I think we should follow. Uh, maybe it's, you or Rich can follow up by email on that. Uh, the the money to that that the bid is giving to this park is coming from its open space from the open space fund for the square bid. So it's it's not any management agreement with the city, which is what the meatpacking bid and the Village the Island problem. Alliance. Company, yeah, both of the plaza. Um, but it's I actually I'm not sure about that, Carter. I think the capital is coming from the open space fund. Yeah, we don't the know expenses. Well, well yeah. I, I, there's two questions. One is, does the bid have the authority to control public access to the space? And I think we want to make mention of that. And the other is, if it did, and if it were doing so to raise money for some reason, I don't know what that would be. What would the legitimate reason be and where would that money go? So those are two questions that I think might be worth noting in a resolution because we didn't get a chance to ask them outright. I, I would rather that we put it in the form of a question rather than being adamant that we wouldn't. Yeah, it. yeah, okay. That we'd like more clarification on the role that the yes. bid will play in terms of- And what the, and what the uh, potential uses would be. 
Okay. Activations. And Call it activations. activations. I think you should get that before we write the resolution. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. We should send them an email in writing yeah. and get a response. And if we don't get a response, then put the question. But yeah. we should okay. try to get the answer. Okay. That sounds great. Uh, did anyone hear anything else? Uh, I was concerned about safety uh, in that dark, bosky part of the park. It's not going to uh, be that dark. It's only like a I, I'm just looking to that. Well, I, I'm not saying that it's going to be dark and scary. I'm just saying that we want to make sure that it isn't dark and scary because uh, we certainly have plenty of parks of darkness where people do things that encourage other people to attack to and yeah, yeah so i suggested uh down lights in the area for the evening and i don't see any reason why they would object to that because it's like very cheap now to do like you know led lights that are down facing i don't evening. think we need to make a suggestion to them no, I think they should just, do that yeah they should do like that's easy yeah we just so, we just want to raise to them the concern make sure that they are covering that which i'm sure they are Part of what we're I, saying? I was just going to say, I was looking at some of the old plans for the other water treatment sites. Yeah. This site is in between in size, the other two sites. It's fairly big, but to what Rich was raising, it's not that big, but it's also not that small. And if you go look at the pictures of the other two water top sites as they exist today, the pictures, or actual pictures, actual pictures this stuff takes up a lot less space than it does on paper because it's three dimensional. Like a circle for an umbrella is over you. It's not right. physical. So the rendering is not dissimilar to the pictures of the other sites. And that's the concern that I'm raising is that this one has this funding. It's for stuff. Right. It's not being used. And everybody's like, oh, trust us, we'll get there. I think we need to be adamant that this is much more actively managed. Okay. Be because it's that was the distinction of why the bid is involved in in this space and you know to the tune of substantial amount of yeah well the, also the build out but and, also the name and it's an important component too in this particular area of really getting more activity you know we've already identified this as an area where we want to see more affordability whether that's through the parks whether that's through the, the you know, whatever may may happen at the Tony Dapolito Center, whatever's happening in ground floor at 388. But this is a big part of that. And having this work is in our interest. And we should lay this out now because we lost every year that went by, stuff was lost to one of our sites. And we came out with what little is there. Okay. And that's the bid that so makes the difference. That you're saying let's, um, let's, let's make sure that we stress this question of activating the space for as many different yeah. populations, furnishing. Yeah. furnishing, activating the space for as many different populations at different times of day. It's going to be, the place is going to have a lot of different kinds of activity. Um, so that's great. The DEP has to come down a little bit on this. We need permanent access to all the I don't space. Think, all I don't think that's really <laughs> what it is. It, it's guidelines because a lot of this is who moves the stuff. And that's okay. what we were told when we were speaking about the Fort Street water tunnel site, is they said, when the truck comes up for its Tuesday visit, that's not the truck driver's job to move the stuff. His right. job is to go to the DEP site. And so if there's something there, that's not in his But the DEP, there's not an agreement about this. And that's what we push. Although I will, right. So I think so, we can, stress is what was raised in the meeting where bid said that they are already in close conversation with the dp and their and plan is to coordinate and right and their plan is to coordinate that so i think all of that will be stressed in the in the and resolution this is the point at wrapped and gail there's supposed to be tables and chairs there's supposed to be ping pong tables there was supposed to be a big huge tree in the middle we're supposed to have all the seating elements around it and none of that is there okay no. we selling Wait, can we not go into that right now? Just no, but I, but it's really late. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is that they're appropriate to have in the midst of all the rest of this. And I think I right, Rich, you heard what he said, right? I and I think that I would the, the temperature I get get gauged in this room is that there was a lot of support for the design. Yeah, but um, I was very pleased yeah. with uh the amount of uh what they've done with uh you know a, a constrained situation. Yeah, but you know, um, you know how the resolution goes. I mean, it's we like the design, but there are some questions or there's some things that need to be guaranteed or pledged or promised, or however you want to word it. Or clarified. I I don't want to be too negative. Um, yeah. I guess uh, the bigger and the bigger question is, um, you know, yeah. how does everyone feel about the um, you know, designing this without any uh any without really knowing what's happening on the north side uh, in, in any detailed specifics. That's well, my feeling about it is, it's going to work, and we're not going to wait five years to design this park. I mean, the chances of it not, I mean, yeah, there's a chance it won't work and something won't work, but I mean, it's, it's going to work and, and we don't want to wait five years to see this hard yeah. happen. That's my personal feeling. I agree. I don't, I don't know. I didn't hear any sentiment for waiting. Five we years. didn't hear any sentiment for waiting. Well said. 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 Well I think that's the worst case, which is crazy that back part of this park there's trucks, right? Or some access. I mean, it's not it's better to get it used because yeah. you have a whole other lifespan. Yeah. And it's the only thing that and it may be expensive, but if another park removes it, which is the permeable parts, that's really the main part that's going back with some planters, but the, that's stuff that can be moved. You know, realistically, but it's better to get it going. Yeah, yeah. So, no, you know, no, point. No, point. no one at the meeting seemed to yeah. raise the concern about designing this. Uh, well, for the oh, I did raise yeah. the point that the most rigid part of the design is right up against where the building's going to be. And they either listen to that or they don't. Well, we can find, yeah. I, you know? it's, it's, a, it's the big point. I, I, I just I don't think um, I think we we've all come around to this perspective that it, that it's not worth waiting. I think the question yeah. is, can anybody visualize a design for that building that would somehow impact this, the you know this design? That that well, she it, she said something that uh, that reminded me of the High Line when they built the Caledonian on the High Line. They put a door from that building onto the park. And then they realized that it's against city policy to have private access to a public park. So when she said that, the, what, what did she actually say? She said the, the park couldn't, the building couldn't open onto the park. Yeah. Uh, you know, to put to to build a building and turn the buildings back to the park seems a little strange to me. But we haven't; it hasn't been designed yet. So it could be a climbing wall. I mean, there are options. Yeah. Let's put a door on the corner. Um, I, Rich, do you feel like we have what you need to write a resolution? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I can't guarantee it'll be a good resolution, but yeah. No, I, I mean, they're never guaranteed of that when you're writing. Uh, I mean, like multiple bad ones. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be multiple bad ones, but uh, very no. 10,000 feet. Yeah, I just, I just, is there any, are there any cons other concerns we want to just uh, point out or any other, uh, I'll go back through the tech, the transcript, uh, but. Um, I'm very concerned about the trellises because seriously, I don't know any trellis that has worked in any New York City park. And the horde right. told me this is something like when I independently commissioned them and said, we will pay anything for these to grow. They were like, it's impossible. Yeah. Okay. So like, we're you know, like even if you're gonna pay privately for them to do that, they're like, it's just not structurally possible. All so right. like, we're, we'll make sure to put that in the resolution. That was mentioned several times. Yeah, I mean, it's just that can't happen again. You just want to express how do you want it in? The, you just want to express concern about the, that aspect. I want the system. horde to come and say that they can plant and actually make yeah. it successful. Okay. An independent party to say that they can actually make it work. Because it's just crazy. We have this, like, we, you know, people want to spray paint this all on a regular basis. It's awful. Okay. All right, uh, and, all right, and guys. We'll go through the transcript and pick up the other ones, like, around the heat on the, uh, that bar or the, whatever that thing's called.
It could just be, um, it could just be wa wrapped. Like certain yeah. types of the year, it could be wrapped. I don't think that's a, a you know, killer. It's just, if it's metal, it's going to burn just like at, you know, everywhere else. Yeah, the Union Square, yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. And thanks, Susanna, for covering for me. It's uh, 2 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm in Paris. It's 3 in the morning. Oh, you're in Paris. Oh, we feel so bad for you, Rich. All right, all right. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. At nine o'clock, exactly. Good night, everybody. This is the.